Good morning. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to have you here today. And welcome to the second meeting of the third term of the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee. Those of you who are here in the McGowan Theater and watching online on our YouTube channel might notice the difference in setup today. Our advisory committee members are actually seated in the theater's front row to listen to an onstage panel discussion by some special guests from the inspector's general community. The committee members will move to their onstage on seats after we hear from our guests. As you know, records management is at the heart of what we do here at the National Archives, and proper records management is vital to the success of our mission to provide public access to our holdings. We at the National Archives have observed that proper records management also is essential to the Freedom of Information Act process that works for all. This FOIA advisory committee at its inaugural meeting of its third term in September established three topics to explore over the next two years, time of volume, vision for the future of FOIA and records management. And the convergence of FOIA and records management will play a large role in today's meeting, which is fitting as both are so deeply entwined in our mission. Today we'll see records management and FOIA through the lens of inspectors general at four departments and agencies from a cabinet level department to the intelligence community to two small independent agencies. And later this morning, Lawrence Brewer, the chief records officer of the United States, will give an overview and update on records management issues. I'm confident that these speakers will spark interest and creative, creative thought, not just among the seven members of the records management subcommittee, but also the entire committee. I'm hopeful too that today's presentations will ignite some ideas that result in recommendations to me on improvements to the administration of FOIA. As always, I'd like to thank all of the committee members for your generous donation of time and continued effort and commitment to improving FOIA. And now I'll turn you over to Alina Sima. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, and thank you all for joining us for today's second meeting of the 2018-2020 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee, uh, whether in person, via telephone, or via live stream. Um, I will introduce everyone to my right in one second. I just have a few preliminary um, notes that I have to go through. Uh, as the Director of the Office of Government Information Services and Chairperson of this committee, I'm excited to kick off our second meeting of this term. We have a very packed agenda today, and I will do my best to keep me moving along so we can end on time. Um, I have a few housekeeping notes before we launch into our meeting. Uh, as most of you know, the FOIA Advisory Committee, which reports to the Archivist of the United States, provides a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues and offers members of the public the opportunity to provide their feedback and ideas for improving the FOIA process. We encourage public comments, suggestions, and feedback that you may submit at any time by emailing foia-advisory-committee at nara.gov. At the end of today's meeting, we will have time for public comments, and we look forward to hearing from any non-committee members who have thoughts or comments to share. An OGIS staff member, Sheila Portanovo, our attorney advisor, will be monitoring the live stream throughout the meeting, so if you have any comments, uh, please submit them in writing, and we will read them out loud during the public comment period. Uh, for our committee members joining us on the phone, and if you're watching us on live stream, uh, Sheila will also be monitoring live stream for any questions you may have. Just be sure to turn off the volume on the live stream if you're going to be speaking on the phone, otherwise the volumes interfere. To promote openness, transparency, and public engagement, we post committee updates and information to our website, blog, and Twitter at FOIA underscore ombuds. The URLs to these sites should be on the slide behind me, but they will be soon, if they're not already. Uh, stay up to date on the latest OGIS and FOIA Advisory Committee news, activities, and events by following us on social media. Information about the committee, including members' biographies and committee documents, are all available on the OGIS website. <coughs> We are live streaming this meeting and will make the video, transcript, and meeting materials available on the committee's webpage as soon as possible. We expect to have all materials related to this meeting available on our website within 30 days, so please bear with us. For those of you who closely watch the FOIA Advisory Committee meetings and for uh, our committee members who are here today, you will notice, as David pointed out, that this meeting looks a little different. Uh, we will start by hearing from a panel of representatives from four Inspector General's offices 
who will be discussing recent audits and reports that their offices have issued in connection with records management um, and FOIA issues. For logistical reasons, we just couldn't fit everyone on the same stage. Um, also, as a result of today's configuration, we will dispense with introductions of the committee members. Um, I will note Jason Barron is unable to attend. Um, I understand the following members are on the phone. Chris Knox, Sarah Kotler, Ginger McCall, Michael Morrissey, Patricia Weth, Lizette Cotillias, and Abby Moshe. At the conclusion of our panel, we will take a 15-minute break during which time we will ask the committee members to come up to the stage and settle in to our regular formation for the remainder of the meeting. Immediately following the break, when the committee is all back together, we will review and approve the minutes from the September 6th meeting. And during our mid-morning break, you may wish to purchase food or drink at the Charters Cafe located on this level. But as a reminder, no food or drink is allowed in the theater. Also, please note there are restrooms directly outside of the theater and another set near the cafe. As the archivist has noted, our agenda today has shaped up to be focused on records management, the subject of one of the committee's three subcommittees. The time, volume, and vision subcommittees will have their turn at future meetings, we promise. And now, a quick but important message from our sponsors, the AV folks, who make these meetings run so smoothly. We had some challenges at the last meeting with the telephones and committee members calling in. So I always encourage as many committee members to come in person. It makes our lives so much easier. Um, I will work to check in frequently with those on the phone. If I forget, please remind me. And we have a list of do's and don'ts. I believe Kirsten sent this around uh, earlier. Uh, but please say your name before speaking every single time. I'm also not good about remembering that. Please uh, bring the microphone in front of you and hold 8 to 10 inches from your mouth before speaking. Please move the microphone back when you are finished speaking. Please keep wireless devices to a minimum and away from the microphones. And if you don't, do not press switch any buttons. Do not sneeze, sigh, or clear your throat near the microphones or breathe. Uh, do not shuffle papers near the microphones. Do not hit or tap the microphone heads. Uh, and we have tip sheets to remind the committee members also when you come back after the break. Um, this meeting is being closed captioned. By following these instructions, we will be able to make this public meeting accessible to all and make it easier for our folks who will be working on meeting minutes um, afterwards. So thank you for that. Um, so at this time, I am uh, very, very pleased to introduce and welcome representatives from four Inspector General's offices. Um, and I will briefly introduce um, all of them and they will each give an overview of their work with regard to records management and FOIA issues. Uh, we want to thank committee member Jason Barron, who suggested this panel, but who's not here today. Um, and although he's not able to be here, he was sure to send us a list of 17 questions. Um, and if I forget to answer, uh, to ask all of them, Ryan is going to help me, right? Thank you. Um, so um, I also want to allow time, plenty of time, for committee members to ask questions. OGIS staffers will be holding microphones and will bring them to committee members on demand. Uh, we have also included a handout in your folders with the links to the reports that we will be discussing today, and we will also post them on our website. So I had, uh, I guess Kirsten did this in alphabetical order, but to my immediate right is Janet O'Connell. She is the inspector with the Intelligence Community Inspector General, uh, which conducts assessments within the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and across the intelligence community to evaluate effectiveness of programs and compliance with law and policy. Recently, she served as a team lead for an assessment of intelligence community FOIA programs completed in September 2018. Kirsten and I had the pleasure to meet Janet and work with her. So we have a little OGIS blurb in there, which is good. Um, more than 30, you have more than 30 years of federal service in a variety of security, policy, and management positions, both inside and outside the intelligence community. Uh, to Janet's immediate right is um, uh, Jeffrey McDermott. Uh, Assistant Inspector General for Evaluations and Special Projects, the Office of Inspector General at the Department of State. Lee, uh, you lead investigations of whistleblower retaliation and high-level misconduct, as well as evaluations and review of issues with significant public and congressional interest. Um, you previously served as a senior attorney with the Government Accountability Office and as the Whistleblower Protection Coordinator at the Department of State. Thank you, Jeff. Um, to Jeff's right is Marta Ersek. Uh, who is counsel to the Inspector General at the National Credit Union Administration and also the Assistant Inspector General for Investigations. She has several hats she wears, she tells me. 
She oversees audits of records management issues and is also responsible for FOIA in the office. Um, Marta previously served as counsel to the Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Education and as the Director of Legal Services at the U.S. Postal Service of the Inspector General. And last but not least is Ken Chason, uh, who is counsel to the Inspector General at the National Science Foundation. Um, Ken has a wide variety of responsibilities, including functions related to FOIA and Privacy Act. He previously served as an attorney with the Department of Justice Office of Information Policy, um, and also at the Government Accountability Office, Office of General Counsel, and also in the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corps. So with that, um, I want to turn over to my panelists, and I don't know if you guys all worked out an order in which you wanted to start, or we can do it in a row, um, or we can flip a coin, totally up to you. <laughs> we didn't work on that. We did not work on that. All right, well, I'm gonna look to Ken, who's all the way at the end, to go first. Is that okay? That's fine with me. Perfect, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you, and um, so I'm, again, I'm Ken Chasen from the National Science Foundation, OIG. Uh, since 2017, NSF OIG has done two audits or inspections relating to uh, records management. Uh, one of them had to do with controls over uh, that the foundation has over electronic uh, records management. The other one was somewhat of a related report uh, in 2017 that had to do with some records management challenges uh, uh, in the face of a move to, uh, into a new headquarters building. Uh, and we took a look at, uh, at that as well. Uh, in the FOIA realm, um, in 2015, we did a uh, look uh, based on a congressional request at uh, the extent to which uh, non-career uh, officials uh, had participated or uh, been involved in the FOIA process at NSF. And that was easy to answer. Uh, the answer to that was no, we really only have two non-career officials in the foundation proper, uh, and we found that neither of them had had a hand in the FOIA process. We have a National Science Board uh, of uh, 25 um, uh, uh, presidentially appointed uh, members from usually from academia, uh, and uh, they had not uh, had a hand in the uh, uh, in any of the board's uh, requests. So we can get that one out of the way uh, pretty uh, pretty quickly. The uh, the controls over electronic records management um, that one um, was interesting. Uh, we of course uh, anchored that in the Federal Records Act, uh, and then from there we took a look at the. Uh, NARA uh, implementing bulletins and uh, directives that uh, uh, relate to electronic records management with an emphasis on uh, email, uh, texts, social media, uh, that we uh, took a look at the issue of electronic federal records created on personal accounts, and uh, we did that from the lens of training uh, and risk mitigation through training. Uh, we also looked at smartphone apps that encrypt or automatically delete messages and uh, potentially uh, create a risk of uh, records uh, uh, being um, eluding uh, uh, preservation. Uh, in a nutshell, what we found is that in, in general, the, the agency was doing a great job with electronic records management. And I'll just make a plug for NSF. They were very responsive to our recommendations. And I think it, uh, it underscored how the IG's office can work with the agency uh, for process and program uh, improvements. Uh, and this was a, a, a great example of that. Uh, I'll just touch briefly on kind of what we found and, and what the agency did. Uh, with email, um, we found that NSF was implementing uh, Capstone. Uh, the, we uh, noted that the process uh, did have uh, a little bit of an issue um, at the outset. Uh, not all of the required senior officials were captured in, in, in the foundation's uh, capstone policy. And uh, under the uh, capstone GRS, of course, you have to uh, do that unless there's a deviation that's approved, and that wasn't the case here. Uh, I think there may have been an interpretive issue on the extent to which there was discretion to not uh, include all of them. In the end, uh, we recommended that the foundation, uh, in fact, um, conform to the GRS, and that's exactly what happened, and the capstone policy was fully implemented at the foundation. Uh, text messages and social media. Uh, when we took a look, uh, of course, um, again, NARA uh, 
guidance says these are potential sources of federal records as well, and you have to be able to ensure that they are preserved. We took a look and found that um, uh, there could be some policy and process improvements uh, in these areas to, uh, to enhance um, the, the, the uh, preservation uh, uh, you know, idea and to, to mitigate risk that something uh, would, would not be preserved. Uh, essentially, um, the agency did do that um, with uh, text messages that are created on uh, uh, government-issued uh, mobile devices. Uh, they they uh, created a policy that said you, you send those to make sure those are managed in your out email Outlook folder and then managed according to uh, whatever is the applicable retention uh, period. Um, and, uh, and then with social media, there were some enhancements made to the uh, Public Affairs Office uh, SOP to ensure that uh, social media, that there were clear directions on capturing social media uh, and uh, making sure uh, that was preserved as well. The foundation is also looking at uh, automated um, processes to capture text and social media uh, to enhance the process, and I think that is still uh, underway, uh, but uh, they are committed to doing that. Um, electronic records created on personal accounts. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we took a look at that from the standpoint of training. Um, there's a NARA bulletin in 2017 that um, uh, requires that uh, records management training uh, capture that as a required content element uh, that you, uh, you forward any uh, of uh, such uh, messages to an official account within 20 days uh, of receiving it. And then what we found was that uh, the records management training at the foundation uh, had not captured uh, that, uh, that uh, requirement, and the foundation did improve the records management training to do that, and actually went beyond and uh, made sure that, the, that everybody knew about records management, that it was imposed as an uh, annual training requirement as it should be, uh, that folks coming on board in the foundation take the training within 60 days and they worked it into their training system, automated processes to make sure that people are reminded of the training. Uh, so they, uh, they actually went uh, uh, pretty far beyond uh, there. Smartphone applications that uh, can automatically delete or encrypt. Um, we uh, found that uh, the agency needed to conform to some uh, of the uh, NARA guidance there and uh, make sure that uh, if you're doing that, uh, that you have policies and procedures that require consultation with legal counsel or records management officials. And uh, the agency did create policies and procedures to, uh, con to conform and make sure that uh, uh, was captured. But they actually went beyond. And uh, we found that they had a mobile device uh, software, uh, management software that allowed them to uh, monitor the downloading of applications mm -hmm. and actually to block some of them. Uh, but they hadn't been uh, using those features and we recommended that they do that. Uh, and they were uh, very responsive to it. In fact, came up with, uh, uh, they activated the blacklisting capability, uh, it, it came up with a list of uh, the uh, blacklisted apps and then they monitor it every quarter to make sure that that uh, capability uh, is being effective. Uh, so um, they were uh, they were very responsive to us uh, in that uh, in that regard. I just briefly mentioned the other report that we did in 2017 had to do with getting into the new building. It had 65 percent less space for uh, for records than did the prior the the buildings we were in in Arlington. The agency moved out to Alexandria, so they were in the process of uh, reducing their paper footprint. And uh, not only to get into the, the, to the building, which was the immediate concern, but then also to advance NARA's guidance that you manage your records in electronic format um, by uh, 2019. So the agency was in the process of uh, digitizing records uh, when we got in and took, took a look. Uh, we looked at how that was going. And then we made some recommendations, uh, some, found some things that, uh, that could be uh, enhanced from there. When you start down that process, you need a good inventory. We found that uh, there had been a little bit of a glitch with the initial uh, paper inventory, and uh, that was corrected uh, pretty, pretty early on. 
You need retention schedules that recognize electronic media. If they are uh, old retention schedules, uh, they are going to be uh, focused on uh, paper format. Uh, so, and we were in the IG's office went down that road even before I think some of the before we did this uh, this inspection at least to make sure our house was in order. And then what we found was that you had to go through and get uh, the, your schedules approved by NARA, of course, to recognize electronic media, or you can't destroy your paper. Uh, and if you can't destroy your paper, that sort of defeated the purpose of digitizing. And in this case, there was an, uh, an added risk because the agency was moving. They had to send the, of course, the records would go to a contractor, then to a subcontractor for digitization, and then back and then over to Alexandria. So in the process of all of that moving around, there's a risk of loss or uh, accidental destruction. So uh, the, um, the agency uh, diligently worked on its uh, retention schedules to bring them up uh, into electronic media. Uh, they, uh, they, we found that uh, at the division level, maybe there could have been uh, a greater understanding of what is a federal record as people were boxing up records and throwing out things, getting ready for to move them over to for digitization and getting ready for the move. Uh, that was an especially, uh, especially a challenge at NSF because the, a large part of uh, the foundation's employees are not career government employees. They are oftentimes uh, academics in science and engineering fields from universities who come to the agency for two and three years, perhaps uh, under the Intergovernmental Personnel Act uh, to serve as program officers and uh, in some cases executives. And they may not be as intuitively familiar with the idea of federal records preservation as uh, folks who have been in the federal system uh, uh, as a career. So uh, training was enhanced. Uh, as I mentioned, it was made mandatory and uh, folks uh, have to do it to within 60 days of uh, coming on board. Um, the agency we recommended and they did to make some improvements as it relates to departing employees. They uh, made sure that the exit form required meeting with the records management uh, officials in the divisions to make sure we knew where your records are and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, what they are and, and where they are and uh, make sure they're uh, accounted for and uh, transferred over for safekeeping and uh, from there. So um, the agency mitigated uh, all of the risks and uh, uh, we were happy to work with them uh, to, to help, uh, help that happen. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Kirsten and I were going back and forth about whether to hold questions till the end. And I think we're gonna go ahead and do that. Hopefully everyone's jotting down lots of questions. I just wanna have an opportunity for everyone on the panel to, to present. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Mara. Sure. If she's ready. And, and the questions that you previously provided us, you're going to cover those. After. I will try my best. Uh, okay. Jason is very demanding. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, and he's in India. So, <laughs> he's, okay. yes. So, to the extent you're not covering them, do not worry about it. Okay. I think, though, I, I might want to ad address the last question, Please. Um, which was uh, and, excuse me, my name is Marta Erskine. I'm counsel at the National Credit Union Administration. And the question was, how can the Inspector General Council of Councils yes. work with general counsel offices to improve compliance with records law? Um, I was previously the chair of this group, the CCIG. Uh, Ken, I believe, was vice chair at some point. So the CCIG is an informal group that comprises attorneys from throughout the OIG um, community. So when I was chair, sometimes uh, an IG or someone would say, hey, we need a legal opinion from the CCIG. Well, um, that would be like me or one of the attorneys working for me. You see what I mean? We didn't have like this. It, it wasn't like an office of general counsel. And it's not really like SIGI, which is right. the um, overall group of all IGs that have audit committees and investigation committees, et cetera. But I think that um, we could pass along to our inspectors general, and Ken's inspector general is actually the vice chair, chair of SIGI, of that um, the records management issues and in conjunction with FOIA issues might be a good area for perhaps SIGI to convene a group to do a cross-cutting project or roll up audit reports like many of our OIGs have done on records management or on FOIA. Um, so that that's an idea that we can pass along. That would be great. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you. Um, 
So, um, just before I move on to records management, I just want to touch on my past job at education, um, OIG. As Ken had mentioned, there was a um, congressional request with regard to uh, political appointees or non-career employees um, impact on FOIA. I just wanted to let you know if you weren't already aware of that. That went to many, many OIGs. Um, I, during my nine-year tenure at Education OIG, there were two requests um, that we received as well as a whole bunch of other OIGs, and we looked at um, we did a sample of FOIA requests, looked at the responses, interviewed a whole bunch of people to see if political appointees had said no, withhold that document or redact that. And we too did not find any um, political um, interference with the FOIA process. So, um, and did that twice. I asked at my present IG, where I just began in January, whether they had received a request that they hadn't, so maybe they weren't touching on the, um, the smaller IGs. Um, so. Um, anyway, but uh, my new office did issue um, an audit report in March of this year on records management. Um, this was something actually that was suggested by someone um, in the Office of General Counsel at the National Credit Union Administration because they were well aware of the legal requirements for records management, um, but the resources and attention had not been dedicated to them, so they thought we could help. Um, by doing an audit of it. Um, we found in our audit that they did not have a records management policy. Um, they didn't provide any training on records management to staff. Um, they didn't update their records retention schedules. They were not disposing of records um, under their existing schedules. Um, and they did not have a records management electronic system um, at all. Uh, so. We made a number of recommendations. NCUA, sounds like NSF is sort of like this too, we're very responsive to our recommendations. They're implementing um, many corrective actions, including um, um, getting an electronic um, records management system. That's not gonna be operational though until 2021. Um, so a number of improvements obviously needed to be made. They um, hired more staff. They uh, changed the responsibility for records management from the Office of Chief Information Officer to the Office of General Counsel and hired, I think, three or four people for that and um, also provided records management training um, this year for the first time and developed a uh, records management policy for the first time. So um, a lot of good changes have been made as a result of the audit and their willingness to in improve. So. so I have to ask, how were records managed before the IG came in? To to take a look? Um, well, they had record schedules, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think anybody was really adhering to them because they didn't, so they were just keeping records and not disposing of them. The biggest problem was not disposing of them, but also records were not being kept securely in many instances. They entered into a contract um, with NARA to do a review um, back in 2016, I think in conjunction with our announcing our audit, to see what improvements would be made. So NARA made a variety of improvements, uh, recommendations for improvements as well, and, and as did we in our audit report. So. Okay. okay, thank you so much, Marta. Sure thing. Jeff, you're up. Sure. Thank you, you have a lot, you have a big report to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, in 2015, after the disclosure of the fact that Secretary Clinton had exclusively used personal email while serving as Secretary of State, um, the State OIG opened a review of records management throughout the five most recent secretaries. And we issued two kind of big reports uh, as part of that effort. Um, in May 2016, we looked, we issued a report on uh, the records management and cybersecurity requirements, particularly with regard to uh, the use of personal email and personal devices. Um, and then as part of this, uh, there were questions about the Department of State's failure to respond to FOIA requests that had actually um, been submitted regarding uh, Secretary Clinton's email use. Um, so we also took a look at the FOIA processes within the Office of the Secretary. Um, and that report we, had, we issued in January of 2016. So the FOIA report, starting with that, found several causes of the failure to respond to FOIA requests in the Office of the Secretary. Um, 
Number one, they weren't necessarily searching email um, for all requests. Uh, they didn't have policies and procedures to how to handle a FOIA search. Uh, there wasn't any monitoring or really involvement of senior management in the FOIA process. And finally, there wasn't, there, there was training, the Department of State does have training on uh, the FOIA process and how to do a FOIA search, but n practically uh, none of the officials within the Office of the Secretary had taken that training. Um, secondly, our review of records management across five Secretaries of State also found several procedural failings uh, across multiple administrations. Um, and they're fairly similar, insufficient oversight of the records management process at the Department of State. Um, the Department of State primarily was relying on uh, print and file as a means of uh, retaining email and other electronic records. Um, there weren't any inventories of archived emails and uh, a lot of offices weren't actually retiring uh, email records and other electronic records. They were just kind of holding them onto them. Um, they, uh, there was a separation uh, statement for departing employees, you know, where they certified that you know they weren't taking any records with them, then that they had, um, you know, left all appropriate records uh, with the Department of State, but they weren't having departing secretaries of state signed those statements. Uh, and finally, uh, the department had known for a while that they had lost records, um, but they hadn't notified NARA of that fact in a timely fashion. It was really only when uh, the fact that Secretary Clinton uh, had used personal email as well as um, Secretary Powell uh, it was only really when those hit the news that the department reported to NARA about the loss of records. So between the two reports, OIG made 12 recommendations to the Department of State, mostly addressing these procedural failings, um, the systemic failings, lack of policies and procedures, and lack of oversight. Um, the department did agree to all of them and you know, has made a lot of progress, I think, the majority of them have actually been implemented uh, by this time too. So they have certainly made uh, a number of progress on these. Would you be able to describe in a little more detail the kinds of changes that have happened since 2016? Sure. That would actually be really helpful. Yeah, so I mean primarily um, capstone, you know, for senior officials, they have really um, used that so that, you know, in, in and They've also moved to you know, electronic retention of records rather than print and file, which was just you know, such an um, outdated means of, of records retention and I think was probably one of the main reasons why there really wasn't much compliance uh, with uh, the records retention requirements. Um, you know, people were, and there was, Early on, even before actually Secretary Clinton began her tenure, there was a recognition that this was an outdated means. And the department actually knew at that time that you know, the compliance wasn't what it should be. Um, but they have made uh, tremendous strides since that time in moving to an electronic means of um, retaining records. Um, with uh, regard to both records management and the FOIA process, they have also adopted um, policies and procedures to make sure that um, you know, folks understood um, you know, what was required of a FOIA search and what was required for retaining records. Um, and finally, there's been a lot more emphasis, uh, kind of tone at the top about uh, reminders to employees that uh, records management is important and what their specific duties are uh, in that respect. And as well as when um, there have been numerous reminders when folks leave uh, what they have to do to make sure that the records they created while at the department have been properly retained. Okay, great. Thanks. That's very helpful. Okay, Janet. Okay, you're up. 
Yep. Janet O'Connell from the Intelligence Community Inspector General. And I'm happy to be here to talk about our recent assessment of Intelligence Community FOIA programs, which we wrapped up in September. So we looked at six organizations, we call them IC elements, um, and I'll spell them out. Uh, Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, the National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, National Security Agency, NSA, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. Um, our goal for this report was to look at the effectiveness of the programs in responding to FOIA requests, in particular how they prioritize, coordinate, and um, process these requests to meet deadlines. We also looked at um, how they communicate with requesters, and uh, finally we looked at consistency in responses in terms of if they're responding to a FOIA request, are uh, they providing information in one request and possibly withholding the same information? Are there mechanisms in place to prevent that sort of thing? Uh, we interviewed lots of folks across uh, the IC in these agencies as well as at um, Department of State and uh, Department of Homeland Security. And we met with OGIS and OIP uh, and got a lot of good information from, you know, the real experts, the FOIA professionals, as well as chief FOIA officers, records management folks, transparency folks, um, and looked at various public records. Um, we had a number of findings here, uh, coming out with uh, 10 recommendations overall, and I'll uh, speak about the four sort of high-level findings. So within the intelligence community, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, ODNI, has this really important integration role across the whole IC. Uh, and with regard to FOIA, we found uh, they weren't doing a whole lot of that. And in particular, you know, the FOIA statute gives authority to individual departments and agencies to manage their own FOIA programs. But for the issues that they have in common, we really found that the DNI had an important role to play in addressing those issues and bringing them together. Um, and in the end, the DNI agreed with all these recommendations. Um, for one, they had looked at FOIA issues. In, in 2016, they had found they weren't performing really well and they had some issues and that were raised to their uh, senior governance forum. And they had come up with a, sort of a FOIA improvement plan for themselves, but they just hadn't uh, followed through to implement it. So uh, one of our recommendations was to do that. We uh, speak a little bit about technology in the report, and I know this committee has had subcommittees look at technology, and we looked at a lot of the same things, uh, the effectiveness of these, you know, enterprise-wide records management uh, systems, search, redaction, uh, just coordinating across uh, the, the different organizations when you have, you know, for your requests that involve multiple equities, you know, you're coordinating across. We found that whole consultation process to be very cumbersome and the IT uh, in need of improvement. Uh, forums for folks across these uh, elements to get together and regularly collaborate and try and tackle these tough issues. Um, we thought it was important for them to have a regular body to do that. Uh, and then the these two important government-wide uh, interlocutors, I'll call them, OGIS and OIP, who are really the government-wide experts on these issues. Um, the intelligence community, although regularly working with them, could do a lot more with them, um, in particular because OIP does provide the government-wide guidance, and OGIS has the ability to, to pursue or make changes to the statute. Um, so we, our recommendation is that the IC engage a little bit more uh, with them. And you know they concurred with all those recommendations. Um, our second high-level finding um, dealt with just processing and efficiency, and all of these IC elements are working very, very hard in their FOIA programs and making improvements to try to meet deadlines. But we found, despite all the efforts, it's still very difficult. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We go into some of the details, you know, resource challenges, personnel turnover, complexity of requests, volume of requests. Litigation, we talk a little bit about the impact of litigation on these programs and, and the IT. Um, you know, we, we call out some best practices like, you know, backlog plans are important, looking at the oldest cases, all the things that OIP recommends we took a look at, um, and improving this whole consultation 
uh, issue that, that is a problem. And also, with regard to that, the chief FOIA officers do have an important role to play, and they do, you know, look at the programs annually. Uh, but we found there could be a little bit more feedback mechanism when those annual reviews are done. An awful lot of data is collected that something's actually um, done with this data, that um, they're reviewed, and recommendations are made to the agency head. So uh, we, we saw some improve need for improvement there. Um, in terms of communicating with requesters, um, really an important topic, and programs are working to improve that, but could do more with regard to putting more on their website. Um, folks are regularly engaging with requesters, but uh, we think there can be more with that. We talk a little bit about the um, draft policy, which is not yet in place, the release to one, release to all, where organizations are responding to FOIA requests and have all this valuable information that has been released to a requester. Uh, it would be ideal if they could go ahead and post that everything, all of those requests to their website. Of course, um, there's resource implications of that. But we do report out on how each of those six IC elements have done with that. Um, and then finally, the fourth finding had to do with this issue of consistent FOIA release determinations. And we were not able to find that this was a significant problem within the IC. Um, we found that each of these IC elements did have mechanisms in place to prevent this sort of thing from occurring. An important part of it is being able to do the research up front to know what exactly what previously has been released and uh, to ensure that consultations are done properly so that one IC element might not know the equities of another. These are big, big organizations, and it's important for them to get some training in recognizing uh, what might be uh, the equity of someone else so that they can flag it and get it over to them so that all these are properly reviewed. Uh, so in the end, um, we did have um, 10 recommendations, and uh, all of the IC elements concurred and are moving forward, and we'll be following up to make sure that these are all completed. Um, Chandler, one question I do have is, um, did you find there was an issue related to culture um, in terms of the intelligence community and sharing of information? Was that an issue at all or a, a theme at all in what you were finding? I mean, I wouldn't say it rised up to, to a theme that it was included in the report as any sort of finding. If anything, we saw that it's certainly improving. We have transparency officers now, and there, the culture has shifted from years ago. There is always going to be the need to protect national security information, and there's always going to be that balance between um, sharing and keeping what needs to be classified classified. Uh, but the FOIA improvement plan, the first uh, line in the FOIA improvement plan that the ODNI had had to do with um, rules of the road and understanding protect what needs to be protected but release what can be released. So um, I think that was important to know. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I saw lots of our committee members taking notes. So I am uh, hopeful that there are some good questions out there. And um, I know we have folks ready with microphones. Um, and I want to call, oh, no, Martha's getting a microphone right now. We will be ready in one second. Um, and I want to invite those on the phone, if you have any questions, to, um, to chime in as well. Don't be shy. Can, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. please. What, what do the transparency officials do, exactly? So they work... Um, directly with the public. They try to understand what issues uh, the public most wants to know about, uh, and then they can pursue declassification, historical research uh, projects that can be declassified and made available to the public that are of greatest interest to the public. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a question. Hi, I'm Emily Creighton. I'm with the American Immigration Council, and I'm on the FOIA Advisory Committee. Um, I, a couple, a question, I think, it was obvious from the way that you described some of the um, investigations that took place, but I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what triggered the decision to, to do the, this sort of in-depth analysis of, of record keeping and um, compliance with FOIA 
and, and other um, you know, methods of, of making sure that you were in compliance with the law um, for, for your individual agencies. And then I'm really curious about the follow-up to with the agencies. So where and, and what is there, is that sort of outlined in, in the decision making on, on the part of the agency when they decide how to come into compliance or how to agree with the recommendations that you've set forth? Um, and and what, how, do, how does your, how do the inspector general follow up with the agencies? Um, whoever wants to answer first. Um, I'll answer. <laughs> so You're with regard to our recent records management audit, um, the Office of General Counsel, someone in the Office of General Counsel at the main agency wanted us to do it because um, they recognized there was a need for resources to be dedicated to records management. Um, so it was a referral from them. I mean, we included in our audit plan and make an, made an independent decision about whether we would do an audit um, and we decided to go ahead and do one. Um, and then all OIGs have um, processes in place to make sure that um, agencies are taking corrective actions so that they can close the recommendations. Um, so we all have tools and processes to follow up with that. And is there a time frame for that? Um, if it's a formal audit, uh, there's a, um, I think there's a circular that describes the audit resolution process and provides time frames, then that's kind of government-wide. If they're inspections, it's not subject to that. It's a little bit less formal, but it may be governed by individual, uh, individual agency processes, I think. Is. Right. Um, back um, a couple of years ago, the Inspector General Act, which governs all OIGs, was modified that um, we have to include, um, we do two reports a year to Congress, um, the semi-annual report to Congress is what it's called, and we have to report on open recommendations. And as far as our uh, records management reports, the uh, one on electronic records management, uh, what triggered that was a, uh, a congressional request to us uh, that uh, went into some of the uh, issues uh, uh, that, that we looked at. It, it, it was good. It opened uh, the door for us to, to, to get in and look at that. Um, the, the one on relating to the move, obviously the big driver there was we realized and as part of our, um, we do an, uh, a look, we plan our audits and, and uh, our uh, oversight work every year and so, wow, that's a, that's a big uh, thing that's coming and there's going to be a huge challenge with, with records management. So it uh, was a good risk area for us to look at. And Jeff? ours was too, was uh, prompted uh, by congressional requests. Um, and Secretary Kerry actually had also asked that our office look into it. Um, with regard to compliance, um, we do have kind of an institutionalized process to get, um, you know, we ask the department for milestones um, when they say that, you know, they're agreeing to implement a recommendation. And so we, you know, continually check back with them to make sure that they've actually taken the actions that they've told us that they were going to. Yeah, and, and ours was not initiated by Congress. We just noticed that this was raised to the senior levels of the DNI, the FOIA processing, and thought it was a good, timely issue to study. Uh, and we do follow up regularly uh, to ensure that all the recommendations are implemented. As we do also. Great. Thank you. Tom. Uh, Tom Sussman. Uh, advisory committee member. Uh, first, an observation. It seems to me that the work that all of you have done is extremely effective, relevant to what we're doing, and um, the results, uh, if you achieve results ultimately, that's quite amazing. Uh, which leads me, of course, each agency has different issues, different challenges, different types of records, different problems. But I like the idea that Ms. Ursa mentioned about getting together with IGs and rolling up the findings from the various agencies in ways that you can share among yourselves best practices, resolution to challenges, training um, uh, solutions, and things of that sort. So I wonder if you'd elaborate on that and maybe we could even be helpful in promoting that kind of uh, uh, activity. 
Well, as I mentioned, um, I will definitely mention it to my inspector general who serves on the SIGI audit committee, and Ken's going to mention it to his inspector general who's the vice chair of SIGI. SIGI frequently does what they call cross-cutting projects. It's actually something that's required by the IG Act that they do collaborate to um, address bigger issues that aren't just particular to one or a couple of agencies. And it, it seems like a good idea. I'm not the, we're not the decision makers on whether they're gonna undertake a cross-cutting project, but I will definitely, in mentioning the interest in doing this, um, that this group would be interested in helping and, and one other thing, one other initiative that SIGI has taken actually is the oversight.gov website, which mm -hmm. has rolled up all of the inspector general reports across the federal government. And it's really been useful to IG offices, you know, when you're at the start of a project or you're looking for ideas on um, how to tackle a project or what might be management challenges at your agency that you should take a look at you can take a look at what other IGs have done uh, on that same topic and you know how they approached the project. Um, and it's actually been a really useful tool. Um, Kirsten was great to remind me, we should just uh, let everyone know, SIGI stands for the Council for the Integrity and Efficiency of Inspectors General. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, um, OGIS had the opportunity to come and present. Um, at a SIGI meeting recently, thanks to Allison Lerner. Um, thank you, Ken, for your boss's uh, graciousness. And, um, and we're happy to serve as a liaison uh, to try to connect the groups. Maybe we can get on the agenda of one of the SIGI meetings um, and come and present in a similar fashion. At a CCIG meeting, Council of Councils to IG We could meeting. do it that way or to SIGI. Oh. Okay. Or both. Okay. So, Tom, hopefully that will serve as a good bridge. Yes. I'm Joan Kaminer, EPA. Um, I have a question about the separated employees forms that I think both the Department of State and the National Science Foundation mentioned, but I imagine it applies to all, all agencies that are represented here. Um, in particular, you both mentioned that um, you found that there were you know, potentially lacking in process or procedures or checks for ensuring that separate employees' records are managed. And it certainly plays into the FOIA process as well mm -hmm. for knowing where the records are or ensuring that especially permanent records are maintained properly. Um, I was curious if you um, have any additional information on how that is actually implemented, particularly with regard to um, you know, the National Science Foundation mentioned that the forms require the individual meet with the records officer. Um, I imagine that's not always a possible, um, it's not always the result. Um, and so in situations where agencies can't ensure that separated employees have met the requirements that are outlined in the forms, is there any fail safe or check or other steps that are in place? Uh, for NSF, I. You know, I'm, I'm pretty happy to say I, I just don't know <laughs> what other uh, backups may be there. I know they, the agency was very responsive uh, toward uh, making sure the, uh, uh, the exit process uh, form was uh, included a uh, base touching with the records management official. Uh, I, typically there are uh, even, there are backup uh, folks um, who handle things. So. I, I'm just speculating, I imagine, if the records management official were not available, that there would be someone else uh, who could uh, uh, help step the employee through uh, the, th the records management uh, issues and the records they had under their custody and that type of thing. But I, I can look into it and see what else they need. And at the Department of State, there is, there are now, you know, procedures. Uh, each bureau has its own records officer and the separation process does call for a departing employee to meet with that individual, um, meet with the, the records officer, um, you know, they go through hopefully the, um, you know, fact that they're not to be taking records with them and then have them sign the departure form, the separation statement, certifying that they surrendered all federal records Jen, is that something that you looked at as part of your? No, we didn't look at that at all, so okay. I can't speak to it. 
Are there any questions on the phone? Pardon me, James Jacobs, Stanford University, and a member of the FOIA Council. Um, I, I wonder if you could send your um, your records management audits that you, you've all mentioned a bunch of documents that you've um, done in the previous couple of years. If you could send them to Alina, that would be really great. I'd love to see how the previous FOIA committee's uh, recommendations kind of line up with with um, what you found in the audit and, and so. how we can you know help move those things forward. Good news, we've already provided those to you. They're in your folders that oh, Kirsten great. gave you today. And we're oh. also gonna be posting them on our website. Awesome, thank you. And I, I had one other question. Um, I think, Janet, you mentioned the release to one, release to all. Is that a general policy across executive agencies or is that something that is is starting to be um, talked about in, in agencies? I think that's a really interesting policy. Oh, okay. So I really should defer to OIP to speak to the details of that because OIP, um, it's, it's their effort. <laughs> so. I'm sitting right here. Hi, Melanie Peste from, yeah, that's all right. Um, so we've been encouraging uh, agencies to follow a, a release to one, release to all policy for quite a few years and we had a, um, a pilot where we studied the impact of actually implementing the policy. And one of the things that I think has always been very remarkable was that ODNI was one of our seven volunteer agencies that participated in the pilot. And I think showed a really, uh, they were themselves a really strong example uh, of an agency that people might instinctively think of as being more uh, withholding oriented and yet they stood up and um, agreed to participate in the pilot and have basically adopted uh, a release to one, release to all practice, as have many other agencies. So it's something that, especially now that the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016 requires agencies to post at three requests, an easy way to make sure you're satisfying that requirement is just to post after one request. Um, so there's lots of good reasons to do it, and obviously the other thing is the um, agent, taxpayer resources are going to processing requests. So it makes sense that when we do the work to process records for release that we make them available to everyone, not just an individual uh, who happened to, to ask for them. So there's lots of good reasons to, to, have the, to adopt the policy. Of course, the challenge with doing so, as um, Janet alluded to, was um, there are resource considerations. Uh, it takes time and money to code documents to put them up on the website. We can't just ignore that reality. It, it's typically other people than the FOIA office that are charged with doing that. And so that is the struggle that agencies have with implementing it. Me Melanie, can sure. I just clarify? Yeah, sure. That you said many agencies are doing release to one, release to all. Yeah, definitely um, agencies are reporting to us in their chief FOIA officer reports that they're following just as a matter of, of, of discretion or just practice themselves, mm -hmm. uh, a release to one, release to all. And certainly agencies are doing it to, um, to varying degrees. Uh, not everyone is literally doing every single release, but certainly agencies every year report lots of good examples of, of material that they're putting up on their website and certainly um, records that are requested that you know are the subject of interest by the public are perfect candidates for posting. Yeah, sure. Hi, the, just a follow-up question to that. Um, I wanted name, name Emily Creighton. Phone. Thank you. <laughs> with the committee. Um, I just wanted to follow up to that and, and wondered if you had looked at that um, the posting after three requests issue and whether that was something that the agencies that, that you looked at were, were actively doing or re responsibly doing? Um, we haven't looked at it at the National Credit Union Administration and, and we didn't look at it at Education OIG, but I have had conversations with um, my FOIA counterparts and Office of General Counsel and they've assured me that they're doing that. We're, and but. It's not one um, request, uh, yes, three, yeah. Uh, Melanie Peste again, just a, we've asked agencies again for their 2019 Chief FOIA Officer reports that'll come out in the spring near Sunshine Week. 
Um, we're asking, we ask every agency to report on the procedures they have in place to be sure that they're implementing the rule of three, which is the legal requirement under the FOIA that you have to post when you hit three requests. So it'll, we have a nice body of, of uh, um, material coming in the chief FOIA officer reports from every single agency about that. Thank you, Melanie. Ryan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but as the subcommittee co-chair, the records management subcommittee, do you have any questions? Hi, Ryan Law uh, from Treasury Department. Um, I, I had a general uh, maybe point and question perhaps, and, and maybe it's something that I'd encourage this, the committee and, and our subcommittee might look at more closely. And, I think uh, Mr. Chasen mentioned oversight.gov. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, another panel member uh, mentioned it. Uh, but it's really a tremendous resource, and I think you mentioned it was, does anyone have any insider knowledge of, of oversight.gov, like how it was stand up, who maintains it, how that came to be, that type of information? Jeff, yeah, since sure. you talked about it. Yeah, so it, um, you know, uh, Siggy, the Council of IGs, it, really was an initiative um, that they felt was important. And I think actually the, the Postal Service IG actually was the one that actually built it. Um, and um, SIGI itself actually is not, doesn't get any funding appropriated uh, by Congress. But so the Postal Service IG kind of took uh, the initiative to kind of, uh, you know, build this site and, um, you know, with the help of several other, uh, I mean, all of the other IGs kind of uploaded their uh, reports, um, you know, from recent years to it. But it is a, it is a great tool, um, you know, because you know, we all learn from each other and you can save a lot of work too um, in when you're designing an evaluation or an audit or an inspection by looking at what other IGs have done. And Thanks. IGs are routinely updating it with their issued reports. So it's. Thank you. It's a great, in my view, it's a great example of a, a government wide almost resource where you can go and search and get OIG reports from any agency. You don't just have to go to the State Department website to get the report, but oversight allows you to see you know, the whole picture. It's like FOIA.gov. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, I, looking at Jason's questions, I want to make sure we hit those. Um, it's, it, it seems we've answered several of them as part of the discussion. Well, one question he had was, uh, does a designated individual in the IG office track reports and recommendations coming from OGIS, from OIP, um, on a regular basis or from the, the advisory committee? Um, is, there, is there a process to monitor those types of recommendations? and? Uh, perhaps someone could talk about that. We don't have such a person at NSF uh, OIG, but I think it's it's a good idea uh, certainly to do that. We we do um, we do try to stay in touch with with developments in the FOIA and records management community as we uh, obviously uh, have our own internal FOIA program and uh, we're a component of the agency itself. But then also from an oversight standpoint. Uh, to make sure that we know what's going on and we factor it into our risk base, um, you know, audit planning and that type of thing. Yeah, likewise, at, at State OIG, as um, we have someone that looks at it from, um, you know, our FOIA, we have a FOIA coordinator, a uh, dedicated FOIA coordinator who does, you know, keep track of such things for, um, purposes of making sure that our own FOIA processes are up to date. But um, I think it's a good idea for our, you know, when, we, when we're evaluating the Department of State's FOIA processes to, to keep up to date on those recommendations as well. And uh, one, one last question for the, for the group. Uh, I'm not asking you to divulge any uh, future plans for investigations, but uh, can you kind of forecast your future activities in FOIA and records management uh, over the next several years, particularly in light of 
upcoming 2019 and 2022 requirements around electronic records management? We do the, uh, the audit planning annually. I know we don't have anything specifically uh, focused on that in the 2019 plan, not to say that we might not find room for it, although resources are sometimes an issue there. But I, I do think as far as the 2019 requirement goes, we did cover that in, in the 2017 report. We don't have anything in our current audit plan for it, but we will follow up with regard to the 2019 requirements with them. Yeah, I'm not sure that, that we necessarily do either, but um, yeah, we also plan our, our work just a year in advance. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're in the same place. We don't have anything on the schedule for fiscal year 19 to look at records management. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for planting the seed, Ryan. Of course. <laughs> One can take that back. Um, Mr. Ferrio has a question. Um, a question, and a, um, let me start with a comment. Thank you all for participating. This is um, something that's been very important to me um, to get the Inspector General community involved in records management and FOIA. In fact, um, early in my tenure here, I was invited to speak to the at an Aichi annual conference about the importance of records management and trying to get people engaged in that. We have, and I should tell you that for several years, my Inspector General has been proposing to SIGI um, records management as a cross-cutting project and have been rejected for several years. So um. I applaud your efforts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please continue to do that. My question is, we, every agency does a self-assessment, an annual self-assessment. I'm just curious whether you're aware of that and whether you uh, monitor that f to get some sense of how things are going in your agency. We don't regularly monitor it. Um, I think our information management division, you know, has the lead for records management, so I'm sure they're on top of it. But it's not something we regularly monitor. Uh, but I, we did look at those as part of our FOIA review and thought they were good, comprehensive reviews. As, as part of our records uh, management evaluation, we actually looked at the Department of State's uh, annual reports and actually were fairly critical about um, some of the things that um, they were reporting. Um, you know, it was, uh, the, you know, they were reporting, they were making several certifications regarding uh, their management of email records that, you know, weren't actually um, accurate across the department. We at National Credit Union Administration don't look at it regularly, but we did look at them as part of our records management audit. Um, they did not get a very good score um, from NARA with regard to the self-certifications. Um, upper management wasn't aware of that. Um, they've since become aware of it, so that more attention is being paid to it. And mostly, I think, the lack of score related to the fact that they didn't have a, records, a comprehensive records management policy in place. And we are aware of it, but we have not also regularly looked at the agency, uh, how, they're, how they're doing with it. Okay. Despite the fact that um, our IG has been trying to lobby Siggy, Marta, and Ken, I still hope you will take back our, our, our very great interest in mm -hmm. promoting the dialogue and, and starting to Sure. To, um, to cross-pollinate ideas. I think we're very interested in that. So um, please help us fight the fight. Um, I just want to make sure that folks on the phone, um, our committee members, have had a chance to think about any questions they have. You've been very quiet. Hopefully you're there. OK. All right, um, if there are no other questions, why don't we um, go ahead and move to our break. Um, I'm letting everyone out five minutes early. Don't abuse it. Please be back at 11.30 sharp, uh, sharp. And please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. They did a wonderful job. Thank you again. Thank you.
cross cutting project. Thank you. Can I feel like we've met before? I think we have. Maybe when I was at OIP, it's been a few years. Yeah, so I was, you know, I started my life at OIP. Did you work? Yeah. Many years ago, yes. But, um, you know, then I was a DOJ. You're welcome. I was my home for yeah, OIP right, right after I left the Army. Right, right. I'm sure we crossed paths. Probably so. Yeah. 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 Great place to start. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Great thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Really helpful. Uh, I, really I, hope, I, I found it helpful. Yeah, yeah. I hope you guys will take I, this yeah. back because this is a really important issue, obviously. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll David we'll, said. We'll, 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 we'll try to figure out why it's rejected. Yeah. 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 That would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to start. So I was just going to say to Ken, when I decided education for IG, I had a very active IG, and she was just really cognizant of the fact that in the IG Act it says that we're supposed to be doing cross-cutting projects, and there's just a reluctance of the volunteer because they're so busy. But right. the resources, I think, are always in the back of people's but, minds. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll pursue it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you guys volunteer, that... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. And we'll be happy to give you as much support as you need. Well, well, the other thing is that it could involve something. So they sometimes do these reports where they roll up existing um, audits that relate to the same topic. Pull out the recommendations and what happened. And then just kind of do sort of an overview of that, which would be a useful document, wouldn't it? Yeah, as that opposed to having to go in here very and there timely. And everywhere. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having really to do new work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. You know, so that, that's a possibility. And in a way, we were, I think, trying to do that by just gathering all of you today, mm -hmm. right? Because sure. you all looked at different aspects of records management yeah. issues in each of your agencies. So. Okay. There were four reports uh, right here. Well, right. And, and, you know, we had uh, two in 2017. Right. Uh, um, State Department. Two huge reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. records management. So. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I think that that's a great angle to pursue as well. Okay. Okay. Maybe, okay. maybe something along those lines might be. Do yeah, all uh, I, I'll talk to Allison. And, and, uh, she seems very reasonable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's she's right. Yeah, I mean she's, no, she's right.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for respecting the 20-minute break as opposed to 15 minutes. Um, so before we hear from Lawrence Brewer, um, now that we're all back together as a committee, I want, want to go ahead and have us approve the minutes from our September 6th meeting. Um, I understand the committee members have had a chance to review the minutes, and all comments have been received and incorporated. Kirsten, is that correct? didn't receive any. Oh, okay. No one has comments. Therefore, <laughs> based on the fact that no one has comments, I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Thank you for seconding, although apparently in our roles we don't have to. Um, anyone on the phone um, opposed to approving the minutes? Silence. Okay. Uh, and no one, I, I'm not seeing any dissension here, so we're all in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, so the minutes have been approved. Uh, we will make them available for public inspection. We'll post them on our website. Um, so uh, thank you very much for um, sticking it out past the break. I really appreciate that. Um, and I am now pleased to welcome my colleague, uh, Lawrence Brewer, who is the Chief Records Officer for the U.S. Government. Um, but we call them Crow for short, Chief Records Officer Crow, and the Crow's Office. Um, uh, which works directly with federal agencies to improve records management across the federal government and promote goals of managing the government records directive. Uh, Lawrence joined NARA as an appraisal archivist um, and has held an array of positions at the National Archives, including Director of the Life Cycle Management Division, Director of the Records Management Operations Program, and the Electronic Records Policy Analyst. Uh, Lawrence uh, will present a few topics today, and he has enough time for questions, comments, and concerns from the committee. So with that, Lawrence, over to you. Well, thank, thank you, you, Alina. I appreciate the invite. It's, I'll have to get used to this dynamic, looking over here and, <laughs> know, and looking over here. Um, I was uh, here early, so it was nice to, to hear all the conversation um, about records management and records management topics as we were having the IG panel. So. Um, I just wanted to add that you know we've had our own interactions from the Office of the Chief Records Officer with the IG community. I've been to the SIGI uh, meeting and presented on records management, I think twice. Um, and we regularly talk to our own IG um, at NARA um, to get a sense of what's going on, not only with NARA, but what's going on with the community and where we might be able to help. And James Springs, our IG, has been very good in getting those introductions um, to SIGI and, and trying to keep records management as part of that agenda. So very interesting panel. So what I want to talk about today, if we can go to the next slide, um, are really what I would call the trending topics in records management. I only have really 20 minutes because I want to leave some time for questions. And 20 minutes is not really enough to cover everything that's going on in records management today. So I have to kind of limit myself. but. Before I get into the trending topics that you see up on the screen, I did want to bring to your attention um, some of the good work that we have been doing over the past few years to proactively post many of our key products um, of our engagements with agencies um, that we are doing to promote openness and transparency about the process. We want to, you know, to the greatest extent that we can, educate the public and our key stakeholders about what we do. So um, in addition to our, our active blog, Records Express, I encourage you to bookmark and Google Records Express. Um, we have, over the last few years, uh, been publishing routinely um, status reports and relevant correspondence on unauthorized disposition cases when there are allegations of disposal removal of records from agencies. We have been routinely posting the annual records management reports from agencies, and there was some discussion about that in the last panel. Um, we post the annual records management self-assessment, but we also publish the individual reports from agencies, the records officers, and the senior agency official for records management. Um, their reports are related to email and the strategic direction around records management within those agencies. And you can find on our website the most recent reports for last year and, and also dating back several years. We also, um, I wanted to highlight the fact that we have been, um, because I think it's really relevant, having just come out of an IG panel, been devoting uh, significant resources to oversight. So we have our own oversight program within the Office of the Chief Records Officer where we do inspections of agencies. And we have been routinely posting 
um, inspections of agencies and the full reports unredacted um, as they were uh, submitted to the agencies up on our website. So I encourage you to go to our oversight page um, on the records management website and you can pull down the various records management inspection reports. So there are a lot of other things that we're doing and we're always looking for additional ways that we can make some of these key products, whether they relate to policy, oversight, um, reporting, um, and as we'll talk about in a few minutes, scheduling and appraisal, um, more available on our website um, so that we can um, further engage with the public and our stakeholders. So um, on to the trending topics. So the first one I want to talk about is one that we uh, have been spending quite a bit of time um, in 2018 working on. So one thing that I do want to say is that within our office, if, you, if you've been following the Managing Government Records Directive that came out um, in 2012 um, and the new NARA strategic plan, there are a number of goals and targets in there that really focus on transitioning the government to um, a fully electronic model. So trying to push all the federal agencies to digital government is where we've been focused and trying to get agencies to create records digitally and maintain them digitally. So one of the things that we did have to recognize as part of this is that there's a lot of legacy paper out there. So we need to be able to provide, because that's our job in the Office of the Chief Records Officer, provide regulations, requirements, and standards for agencies when they're doing the digitization of those legacy paper records. So one of the requirements, um, and it was part of the 2014 amendments to the Federal Records Act, was that NAR was required as part of that law to issue standards for the digital reproduction with a view toward disposing of original source records, and that applied to both permanent and temporary agency records. So we have been working on that for several years, and uh, we were very pleased in September of 2018 to be able to post um, a regulation um, for the digitization of temporary records. So it's a very high level regulation. It does have standards, but because these records are not permanent and coming to NARA and they're needed for agency business, the requirements were at that higher level because it's really up to the agency to make sure that they're doing what they need to do in terms of quality control um, and resolution to support their business. So uh, we are adjudicating comments on that proposed regulation. Um, we expect to complete the adjudication of the temporary digitization rule in December um, and hopefully be able to go final with the temporary rule um, in early calendar year 2019. So I also want to note that at the same time, we are working on the more important rule, which is the one covering permanent records and what agencies need to do in terms of digitizing those source records, which is significantly more complicated because it has requirements related to metadata and capture and higher standards, um, which generally map to industry standards for, the, for high quality digitization of hard copy records. So we are working on that, and we hope um, that we will be able to propose that regulation for the permanent records in early 2019 um, and have that available for comment. So um, as we do both of those things, we, we have some information up on our website in terms of FAQs that we have heard about digitization of, of source records. We will be doing more FAQs as we get closer to producing the, the, the permanent um, rule as well. So look for those. The second one, um, status of high profile draft record schedules. I'm sure all of you have been following um, listservs and our blog um, have seen a, a number of the comments related to uh, record schedules um, that have gotten a lot of interest. So um, there's really two things here. So there's been a lot of interest in particular record schedules, and I'll talk uh, in a little bit more detail about the one um, that was submitted by the Department of Interior. Um, but it's not just the schedules themselves, it's also the process. So one of the things that we have been trying to do in writing blogs on Records Express, um, in talking to, um, to stakeholder groups, um, civil society groups, 
conferences. Um, and I believe I'm going to Chicago in January, which I'm really excited about, um, to talk to, uh, I believe it's the uh, American Historical Association, um, on this topic specifically. And what we're trying to do is really sort of um, provide a little bit more transparency and education about you know, how the process for um, approving record schedules happens. It's, it's a process that we've been working for many years. Um, there are a number of um, requirements, and much of it is defined by the um, Administrative Procedures Act in, in, in working with the public through the Federal Register. So part of that is, is pretty well defined, but we, of course, have our own internal processes that, that define how we work with agencies when they submit a request for disposition. So the process has been playing out, and the fact that we get a lot of comments on certain schedules um, is actually a good thing. I mean, we're looking for ways to make sure that we surface issues before the record schedule gets signed by the Archivist of the United States. So this is the way the process is supposed to work. We make the, the, the schedule available for comment, and then my staff is then um, assigned to then work with the agency to do additional site visits if needed, to make sure that the uh, retention periods and the disposition instructions are appropriate for each schedule item that we do. So um, what's been interesting about this whole process is how we have, through this public engagement, identified areas where we can make improvements to our process. And this was something that we knew we were going to do anyway. It's, it's actually part of the new strategic plan in goal three to be able to streamline, modernize, the process by which we uh, work schedules and interact with agencies. So it's given us a lot of information and a um, great place to start in sort of working through that process with agencies. So um, let me then turn now to the specific case. So I'll talk a little bit about the Department of Interior schedule because it's gotten a lot of publicity um, and just sort of explain where we are. Um, the schedule itself has been in development for more than two years, and it is, you know, typical of what a lot of agencies are doing in terms of consolidating authorities using a big bucket approach. So in this particular case with the Department of Interior, they had 411 schedule items that they were then trying to group into fewer buckets. Um, so they were going from 411 schedule items to 23 items, with 18 of them being temporary items and five being permanent. So there's a lot of reason behind this from the agency's perspective and why they would want to do this. And essentially, it comes down to maybe three key factors. So from the Department of Interior's perspective, with all of these bureaus below them, one of the things they wanted to do was ensure consistent implementation across the various DOI bureaus um, on specific records management items. So they didn't want one bureau with a, one set of records disposing and managing records differently than similar records in a different bureau. So the department took the lead in identifying all of these authorities and then be able to produce a schedule that all the bureaus could use and records management could be consistently executed. The other reason for going down to the fewer um, buckets is to simplify management and disposition of, um, of the records. So specifically for the users, if you give them fewer authorities for which they are responsible um, to manage, theoretically they make fewer errors in the execution of the disposition. So we have known for years as agencies are moving to electronic record keeping and they're trying to build records management applications, if you populate a, a drop down list or a pick list for a user with 400 items, it's probably not going to be done very well. <laughs> but if you give them three or four and they are the right three and four, then you have a much better chance of making sure that records management is done effectively. So that's a very key business reason. And I think the third reason is the one that I just alluded to is like, you can't implement and automate records management and move to our electronic record keeping if you've got 400 or more authorities. It's just, it's too burdensome to set up. 
It's too complicated to execute, and records management just doesn't get done effectively. So we understand, we have understand, and we've produced a lot of guidance and FAQs around how to do big box and flex flexible schedules effectively. And you know, a lot of what we have been doing is, is trying to talk about why this is important, because this kind of an approach to scheduling actually makes sure that we get the right permanent records and that agencies aren't making errors in executing disposition against the temporary records they need for their business. So um, that brings us up to date. The current schedule, the, the comment period closed last Monday. We have received over 4,000 comments on the Department of Interior schedule, which is not typical, to say the least. Um, and our job now is to go through each and every comment and then be able to evaluate it ourselves, work with the agency, do additional site visits if needed to, to evaluate um, the particular authorities, um, and produce a new version of the schedule that we can then post to the Federal Register with a statement of concerns and the general themes that were present in the comments, and then allow the public to uh, provide additional comments on the schedule revision. So there's still uh, quite a ways to go in terms of um, getting this particular schedule done. Um, I, I am not going to stand here and give you an over and under on how long it's going to take to adjudicate 4,000 comments, but it's not going to be done before Christmas. Um, so this will be something that we'll be working on into the next calendar year, but of course we're going to try and, and uh, work with the agency who understands it's a priority um, to try and get this uh, schedule revised and to a point where we can post a final uh, Federal Register notice. So uh, let's go to the next topic because it does relate a little bit to this um, topic of schedules. Um, one of the things that, um, as part of the process of, of, and I'm sure those of you who have commented on the DOI schedule have, have seen, the current process for, um, for commenting and getting comments from the public on draft record schedules is we post a, a, an abstract in the Federal Register, and then agencies have to email us for a copy of the schedule, and then we email it back to them and then they email comments back to us, and then we email a response to comments back to them. So it sounds very, I don't know, 1985, 1990, and we're here in 2018. So we recognize this as a problem, and this is one of the areas where we want to do um, some modernization. So one of the things that we've been working on this year is trying to figure out the best way to proactively post all draft record schedules on a website and then use the website and the functionality within the website to engage with the public so that the, the, the public and the stakeholders can pull down or get first get alerted that there are schedules being posted, review the schedules, comment on the schedules, and then we can comment back using the website. So we have been in the process of exploring options uh, I can tell you that one of the options that we're looking at very closely right now is regulations.gov. They actually have improved the functionality of that website to the point where we can consider it as an option. Um, and that's essentially where we are right now in terms of um, making the commitment to using the website. Um, I will say now, since we are in December, um, we don't want to post any Federal Register notices in December or even into January that will require the public to email us. So we are going to hold on posting to the Federal Register using the old process until we can get um, the new web-driven process in place. And the reason why I say we're going to hold and I feel okay about that is because I really believe that you know, we're looking at like January, early February at the latest um, where we will have a solution if it's regs.gov or another solution that we're working on in-house in place to be, to be able to provide that functionality. So um, one of the things that um, I do want to say is we will be letting the public and external stakeholders know that we are doing this via a Federal Register notice. So the one notice that we may publish before January is an announcement in the Federal Register that says we are making this transition. And we will invite feedback via that notice. 
Um, but then when we start posting um, schedules, they will be on a website and not using um, the previous process. So we're very excited about that, and, and we think that's really going to uh, promote transparency and really give people a chance to, um, to be alerted about schedules when they get posted and give them the opportunity to very easily comment on schedules. So the last topic I want to talk about before we get into some Q&A is um, creating adequate and proper documentation. So this is an interesting topic, um, and you know it's one that, that has been in the news, and I know it's being reviewed in the courts in, in a number of cases related to certain agencies. And it's a little different um, of a category for us and the Office of the Chief Records Officer. So we have statutory authority, and we do, as I mentioned, investigate with the agency um, cases of unauthorized removal of records or destruction of records. But this is different. This is a case where claims are being made against an agency that they are not creating adequate and proper documentation of their activities. So there's nothing there. So um, one of the things that, that we have, you know, when we're asked this question, why aren't you doing something about that, the requirement in the law is that agencies and the responsibility is assigned to the head of the agency um, and is generally delegated down to a records management program is responsible for ensuring that agencies are creating adequate and proper documentation of the policies, decisions, organizations, activities within their agency. And as a rule, agencies do this through policies and directives. So, one of the things that we do in our office, um, first, uh, we provide training to federal agencies, and we have a bulletin that we issued a couple of years ago about specific uh, items that need to be covered for all staff and agencies um, when they do their training, and this is one of them. So it gets reinforced um, through the training. It points to the policies and directives that agencies have or should have in place. So um, we, what we do is essentially um, monitor how agencies are doing you know, this and making sure that they are creating the adequate and proper documentation. And we, we ask questions through the annual reporting and the records management self-assessment to make sure that they self-certify to us that they are doing the training and that it covers the required elements in the training. So. Um, so this is an area that you know, we are certainly aware of and, and monitoring and keeping track of. Um, and you know, it's one thing that we can do uh, going forward with our oversight program as we do inspections of agencies to be able to look at the policies and directives that they are creating to make sure that this is in there and then be able to ask some questions of the programs and the people that we meet with in the agencies um, to show us evidence of how um, they are reinforcing this with their training or other activities within their agencies. So again, it's a, it is a trending topic. It is something that's been bubbling up for some time. Um, and it's something that, that we are communicating with agencies on the best way to address. And then we are, are using our oversight um, responsibility and authority to, to make sure that agencies are doing that. So that, that's my four trending topics. Uh, it's pretty much all I could cover in the 20 minutes that I have. I probably could have added a couple more. Um, but I wanted to, to stop here and be able to give you some time um, to ask me any questions. Um, if there are other topics or follow-ups on any of these topics, I'd be happy to, to, to stick around and answer what I can. Great. So over to our committee. Questions? Yeah. Um, Melanie Peste from DOJ. Lawrence, I always think it's helpful for people to know um, why it's a good thing to destroy records. Because I think there's just a gut reaction of, oh my goodness, aren't we keeping everything? And what do you mean people destroy records? So I think that would just be a helpful thing to have you explain. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we certainly heard that too. And, you know, now there's a, there's a lot of interest in government data. It's come up with the Department of Interior schedules. Like, why doesn't, um, you know, the government just keep, keep everything, it. right? Um, if you think about the staggering volume of records that are being created by agencies and electronic records in the data centers, um, 
it, it really, for the community that is interested in access, there is an unintended consequence there. So the more information that you have, the harder it is to find the information that you're really looking for. So what we want to do is make sure that agencies are identifying, and this is what we do when we schedule records with agencies. Tell us the records that you think you need for your business, and let's talk about how long you actually need them to cover you know, legal reasons, uh, statutes of limitations, business needs, and, and let's have a conversation from an archival perspective about the value of those records and how long they have value. And let's make sure that we get rid of those because they're only going to take up space. So we're not doing what records management was when it, when it was originally you know, put in the Federal Records Act in 1950. It was about economy and efficiency. And those things are still important today. I mean, yes, we have the ability to keep more records, but we're not being very efficient in our agencies if we are not taking records management and disposition seriously. So we want to make sure that we take care of that so that we can then focus on what's permanently valuable and what is needs to be kept for a certain amount of period so people can request information through FOIA um, and ensure that it's available and more easy to find. Um, and that's really why we want to do records management, to promote efficiency and effectiveness in agencies, not just for the agencies, but for the public who are interested in getting these records. Great. Yep. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, Ryan from Treasury. Um, question for you about uh, Department of Interior's uh, effort to consolidate their schedules. And I'm intrigued by this and wonder, one, do you, do you feel this is the future of uh, records management agencies? And second, could you perhaps expand on the benefits of their actions, um, particularly with focusing on impacts to FOIA administration? So, for example, will this improve searches? Will it increase the public's knowledge of what records are maintained by the agency and such? Thanks, Ryan. It's good to see you again. Um, so, um, flexible schedules and big buckets um, have been around for quite some time. Um, it was part of uh, a major records management redesign we did at the National Archives, oh God, I don't know, about 90, late 90s, I believe. Um, and you know, the reason why is for, for those main reasons that I talked about, you know, to, to promote consistent um, implementation of schedules, to, to simplify um, choices for the users, but I think most importantly, the, 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 the driving motivation at the time was electronic record keeping. And the, the more granular schedules that were around at the time were just not easily ported into the electronic environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to emphasize about flexible schedules, and this sort of gets to your, your question about access, is that if you look at what's been posted uh, on our blog, um, and what we've provided um, uh, related to the Department of Interior schedule, there's a very detailed crosswalk that goes with the schedule. So the crosswalk is something that is required for every agency that is going to do a big bucket schedule. And the crosswalk maps all of the authorities. So if you have 400 and you're going down to 23, the agency is required to identify what those previously approved authorities are and where they are going. So though that crosswalk stays as part of the schedule. It doesn't go away. So anyone can go to our website, our records control schedules repository, which we have publicly available, and see, okay, well, here's what Interior was doing back in the 90s. Here's where it is now. So that allows the users and the public who they may be familiar with a particular series that Interior was creating you know, back in the 90s, early 2000s. Now they can see where it is now. And what, what the new schedule provides us an opportunity to do is relook at that authority. So flexible schedules by, by no means is an easier path for agencies, nor is it for NARA. It requires much more work on my staff because they're not just evaluating one new schedule item, they have to evaluate the new schedule item and all these other ones that go with it and make sure that what their agency is doing is appropriate. So, you know, hopefully 
by limiting the number, making sure that the right series are going into this new bucket, does provide an easier path for the requester community to find the records that they need. You, because you're not searching 400 items, you're searching 23. Mm -hmm. And the crosswalk is there to help guide the public into what it looked like and what it is now. Hello, Lee, Lee Steven. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, your NARA's oversight responsibility and, and authority in terms of uh, ensuring that agencies are, are complying with, with, with their directives and their guidelines and so forth. So could you just uh, elaborate on what you actually do to ensure, uh, I guess I'm thinking in particular where an agency is not following a directive, whether from you or, for, or its own directive, and, and you become aware of that. What, what actually are the, uh, the, the tools and methodology procedures that you follow and, and, and implement to try to change that behavior? So uh, we do get this question a lot, and I'm just going to say at the, at the outset, uh, our responsibility is one of oversight, not of enforcement. So none of my staff carry guns or badges. I think they would like to, but they don't. So uh, the various activities that we do in oversight have really expanded in, in recent years. So I, it really starts with reporting. So first we collect the data. We have the records management self-assessment. We have reports from the senior agency um, official for records management. And we have, since the directive goal of 2016 around email, been requiring a maturity model for where agencies are in managing their email electronically. So our first step, here's the data, and we identify every agency in risk categories. So we can see from the self-reported data who the high-risk agencies are. So that is a key trigger for us. And we can take that data and then move on to our other oversight activities, which are formal agency inspections or a new product, which is, um, we call them records management self-assessments, which are more topic-based. So like, for example, we have done um, an agency assessment on the implementation of email using a capstone approach. Mm -hmm. And for that kind of assessment, we're looking at like 13 to 15 agencies at one time and trying to gather best practices and lessons learned that we can then share with other agencies. It's different than the formal inspection where, where we require them to submit a plan of corrective action that we then monitor. So to get to your, your, your real question about what do we do if, if an agency, for example, doesn't comply with the plan of corrective action or doesn't make changes if they're, they're high risk. So what we do is we report to OMB and we report to Congress. So we have an annual report, but we also send our annual records management self-assessment to congressional staff and we send it to the Office of Management and Budget. So we rely on them as our oversight entities to um, tell us what their concerns are and, and help us you know, get compliance. And we have spent quite a bit of time talking with uh, congressional staff, and we have meetings with OMB, um, and we try and highlight these things and then follow up directly with senior agency officials for records management to make sure that some of these changes are, are being made. Um, really, other than reporting up to our oversight entities, we don't have any real formal recourse in making the changes happen. We have, in the past, relied on IGs and agencies to sort of help us because they do carry guns and badges. So <laughs> we have worked with IGs, uh, particularly at state, um, and you can probably guess where that happened. Um, <laughs> but in other agencies as well, we, we've had good relations with relationships with IGs, and, and they are more effective at really making those changes and requiring those changes to happen within the agency. So there's a lot of things that we have that we can do and that we can consider, short of, you know, locking people up in the records jail in the basement of this building. But, <laughs> you know, it really depends on the seriousness of, of the issue. And, you know, we do look at, you know, the path over time. So if we see repeated, you know, year after year, high risk, they bubble up to the top of the list, and we'll take those issues and those agencies more seriously. Uh, while everyone's thinking more questions, I want to just make sure I get to the folks on the phone. 
Anyone on the phone have any questions for Lawrence? Bobby at Consumer Product Safety Commission, and I had a question about the permanent record digitization. Um, you mentioned that in early 2019, you're going to publish an MPR on um, the standards or something um, to that effect. But should agencies um, just wait until there's a final rule before they digitize permanent records, or? Uh, what should we be doing right now? Right. So um, a lot of um, guidance has already been issued in FAQs on our website, and I, I encourage you to go to Records Express and do a search for digitization, and some of those FAQs will come up. Short answer is, once we have a proposed rule, um, and, and this was the same for temporary records, and it will be the same for the permanent records when it gets proposed on... Um, the Federal Register. Once that proposed rule is out there, agencies can then scan and digitize against those proposed standards. They do not have to wait until the comments are adjudicated and a final rule is published. This was the guidance that we received. We got legal opinions on this. Um, and um, we believe that it, you know, that is something that's appropriate and you know, there's a need for agencies to be able to get to this sooner rather than later. So uh, we were able to, to make that happen for a lot of agencies. Once they're proposed, they can go forward. So do it now, Thank don't you. wait. <laughs> but don't, don't throw away any permanent records yet because it hasn't been proposed. Okay. Yep. Hi, Bradley White, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, 4,000 comments to a proposed record schedule is incredibly high. What is a usual number, <laughs> and what kind of things do people actually comment on? Is it, in this case, the narrowing of the categories of records? Is it whether or not something's temporary or permanent? What kinds of comments do you get? Right, so um, in the past, looking back, you know, we've been doing this process for a very long time, and you know, perhaps I was deluding myself into thinking that we were just doing a really good job, you know, appraising schedules and items on schedules because we, we generally typically didn't get very many comments on schedules. So we would always have a few requests for the schedules. And in a lot of cases, the people who would request a schedule wouldn't submit comments. They just wanted to see it. And then when they looked at the appraisal report with the schedule, they could say, oh, okay, this makes sense. Um, occasionally, you know, we'll give me like one or two, maybe, you know, three to five comments on a, on a schedule. Um, and we're able to work with the agency quickly and adjudicate those and move on. So um, what we saw with um, the DOI schedule and then previously with uh, the ICE schedule, Immigration Customs and Enforcement, uh, which was also, I think that was significantly higher than 4,000 comments, um, is anomalous. but anomalous only in this, only looking back. I can't tell you if that's gonna be anomalous looking forward. Um, because as I mentioned before, we are going to be really focusing on pushing schedules, all schedules up on the website. So it's hard to say whether or not the fact that, you know, people had to email back and forth, dissuaded people from requesting schedules and commenting. We'll see once it's available on the website whether or not we get more engagement that way. Um, but this is quite a change and, like I said, anomalous for where we are right now. Um, and, you know, we will, you know, we'll just have to see. You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, certainly we're aware of the environment with which we work and I think there's a lot more attention to what government is doing now. Um, and I have tried to spend a lot of time, you know, talking with the public, civil society, civil society groups that there's really nothing nefarious about this project, I mean this process. We are doing what we've always done, and the process is working the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to, to solicit comments, and we're supposed to adjudicate comments, and work with the agencies to make sure that what we're doing is appropriate. So that won't change. I might need a lot more staff. So I don't know. Just, if, this, if this is being recorded, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that right now, so if anybody sees that, I need more staff. Understood. Well, Lawrence, I just want to thank you. Um, I, I'm eager to move on because we still have a lot on our agenda, but I, you said you're going to stick around? I will stick around. And um, 
folks can ask them questions if you think of anything else. And Joan, I'm sorry if I cut you off. Oh, I, Unless, I was, you? sorry, Joan Kaminer. I was just curious if the ICE schedule was also a bucket or a capstone um, approach. Because um, mm. I'm wondering if that's. It's not, it's not a bucket schedule in the way that Interior is. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's, it's much more precise, a little bit more granular, mm -hmm. and definitely at a lower aggregation. And it doesn't, the interior schedule is a little bit unique in that it's department-wide. ICE is just for ICE. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm eager to keep things moving. Uh, we're gonna go on to the next item on our agenda, which are our subcommittee reports. Uh, we are going to make this a standing agenda item going forward. Um, and I just want to thank all the subcommittee uh, co-chairs and members. Um, I know there's already been a lot of activity and folks are working hard. And I just want to thank you for all of that. Um, and I'm going to pick on Ryan first in no particular order. If we could hear from records management, sure. uh, a report out and tell us what you've been doing and what's what's ahead. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Lena. Uh, and on um, behalf of myself, the committee, subcommittee, and Jason, thank you for um, putting together today's agenda, which focused uh, very, very in, in depth on records management. Yep. And uh, we're going to be thinking about that as we meet in our next, in our next session um, for the subcommittee, which will be on December 10th. Um, so the subcommittee, since our first meeting, had our, had our first inaugural meeting um, where we um, had some a brainstorming session where we talked about kind of what the focus of the subcommittee should be in records management. Um, we uh, gathered a bunch of ideas and uh, came up with a number of questions that we should consider before our next meeting. Um, so uh, really at the beginning of our process and uh, we again as I mentioned we'll be meeting on December 10th um, and to consider not only those questions that we asked at the last meeting but also uh, the information we've gathered here today. Uh, that's where we stand now, and we'll likely be meeting um, either biweekly or every three weeks uh, moving forward. Great. Um, I also just want to encourage anyone else on the committee who wants to join the subcommittee. There's always an opportunity to do that. Probably has the least amount of, uh, of uh, participants, so sign up early and often. Uh, how is that for a good pitch for more volunteers? Please join. Yes. yes. <laughs> so thank you. Um, anyone else on the subcommittee want to add anything to what Ryan said? Okay. Um, next, I'm going to ask Emily Creighton and Bradley White to report out on the Time Volume Subcommittee. And you guys have been busy as well. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on the joining other subcommittee suggestion. If, if we knew when the times were for, for your next call or convening, um, maybe that would be a way to invite our very robust, we have a very robust uh, <laughs> subcommittee. So there may be members who would who would like to join that call, including myself. Um, so Bradley White um, is my co-chair, Emily Creighton, um, and he'll add anything that I'm, I'm skipping here or missing. So we have um, had a couple very substantive calls where we've discussed um, some of the issues that we think impact um, time and volume in, in the implementation of FOIA. So I'm sure there are many ways to frame the mandate of this subcommittee. Um, but I think in general, um, and, and this subcommittee is composed of almost all um, government members, with the exception of myself and Ginger McCall. So um, I think it's- And Kevin. And Kevin, what am I saying? And Kevin, of course. So I think, um, so it's a good balance, but I also think, maybe I just feel outnumbered. I don't know, that might just be how it feels to me. Um, but I think that uh, it's, it's been a good balance in that we, are, we really uh, voiced concerns on both sides um, about issues that requesters see and that um, folks who are adjudicating the FOIA requests see and dealing with FOIA litigation see. So um, really we're, we're looking at how to, ch how to address the challenges related to complying um, with the statutory mandate around um, replying to requests which in the, within the time frame mandated by the statute and with the limited resources that agencies have where there are numerous complex requests and often very voluminous. So we had a good discussion about, we were brainstorming and throwing out ideas um, we came up with seven action items and so have really formed seven smaller committees which consist of about two to three members. Um, and each one of those committees has a point person. 
who is really responsible for driving the work of those smaller committees. And so I'll just briefly describe what um, each one of those smaller committees is tasked with at this point. Um, and, and I should thank Ginger McCall, who really helped guide us. She has been on this committee in, in a previous term, um, and so had some good ideas in terms of how to go about um, standardizing our research methods. So one of the subcommittees will be looking at tracking the progress on past recommendations. And I also want to say that Kirsten has, has really been helpful in offering up resources and um, um, individuals who will be doing research on behalf of the subcommittee and helping us answer questions like when we talk about tracking progress on past recommendations that we will be doing that in, the, in future meetings. So um, we'll have the benefit of that um, already established process. But we'll be, we'll, we would like for this committee, this smaller committee, to look at relevant recommendations from previous advisory committees in areas where we should really follow up in, in progress around the, the issues that we're looking at in, the, in this committee and establish um, our position on recommendations for increased resources, keeping in mind that recommendations go to the archivist and not to Congress, as Kristen reminds us, Kirsten reminds us. Um, but we, uh, we really do realize that the serious need and urgent need for resources um, as part of the, the solution here. Um, the second smaller group will be looking at the issue of complex requests, which we understand is really um, one that is particularly challenging for agencies. We'll be looking at reviewing annual FOIA reports to see the number of complex requests, and that group will be thinking about how to research this issue and look more closely at this issue. Uh, the, third, uh, the third group will be looking at international, re will be looking at international models. Um, so really looking to see whether there is guidance there, um, and we have some ideas about uh, people to look, look to for guidance there and research there. Um, the fourth group will be looking at a list of agencies, developing a list of agencies to be surveyed based on criteria including agencies with very large backlogs and those that have re achieved reductions in backlogs. And Kirsten again was helpful in, in pointing us to some resources that are out there in terms of agencies that have, have achieved this. Um, some reductions in backlogs such as USCIS. Um, another group will be looking at developing a, a list of requesters um, to be surveyed based on criteria where these requesters are frequent submitters of complex requests to agencies, um, those that, that prevail in litigation, and those that request large amounts of data. Um, another survey uh, for requesters will address, um, so that's for requesters. So agency representatives will also, there is a survey to being, being developed for agency representatives that look at really um, the root issues of time and volume challenges at those agencies, how they treat complex requests, costs associated with the complex requests, um, and how regulations are interpreted to streamline responses to requests, for example, when a request is deemed reasonable or unreasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and where requester education is really needed for them to understand how the process works and technology um, concerns and how technology is is used and um, maximized to ease the process for different agencies. So those were some of the areas where we think we need to look more closely. Um, and I know folks have already started the work. And there's, there have been conversations that have happened outside of the larger group meetings. I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add or anyone else would like to add from the committee. OK, that's where we okay, stand. Great, thank you. Anyone on the phone? Have any questions, comments? You guys have been very quiet today. I have one question. Yes. Hi, uh, James Jacobs. Um, the, I'm interested that you're uh, thinking of creating surveys. I wonder if, if those surveys can be expanded outside of, of your subcommittee. Um, there might be questions that records management um, or other, other subcommittees could could add questions to those surveys. I think that'd be really interesting. Absolutely. So as we develop the surveys and, and have drafts to share, I think it'd be a very good idea to share with the larger committee, and I hope to do that. I mean, I think we've talked about how we would reach out to committee members um, to supplement the work, to help us with the work. So, yes. OK. Anyone have any other? Yeah, Ryan. Just one, uh, just one comment, Ryan. Sorry, 
Um, and it's something the committee should look into, or perhaps so just should, uh, before surveying the public, it'd probably be prudent to make sure that the committee is not subject to the provisions of the Paperwork Reduction Act, right. which require public notice and among other things before a survey is conducted. So, right. um, I heard you talk about a survey of agency. We did talk about a survey of agencies, though that, and that has been done by this committee in the right. past, but we had, right. from my understanding is that they had not interview surveyed the requester community yeah so any survey to the public that yeah. asks the same questions to 10 or more people requires a PRA analysis I'm not sure if yeah. FACA is specifically excluded from that so. no and in fact I recall from the last term of the committee that that was an issue okay. um, that sort of kind of stopped um, in in mm -hmm. the tracks of the, some of the work that was being done in one of the subcommittees so okay that it doesn't mean we can't revisit it and we so can, as, as, as the person, I believe, who is doing the, pulling together the questions and surveys for the you, requester Kevin? community, what is our recommendation then on that? I mean, how should we proceed? Not do that survey, I, you know. Uh, I, would, well, I would really hate to see you not do the survey as a, as a principle, but I think we have to study a little more about how the Paperwork Reduction Act fits into all of this and what hurdles we have to go through. That's, yeah, I agree, Kevin, that we should research that immediately. I mean, at, during my time in the Ombudsman's office, which had a public-facing facet, we also dealt with this issue, but there are certainly ways to address it. It is not, uh, I don't think it should make us stop in our tracks, no. for sure. No, I, I was thinking yeah. I would still kind of work the list of questions up, and if we don't end up putting them out, we don't end up, we find another way to right. address those questions. But that's so. a good issue to raise. One, of, one of the many hats I wear at Treasury is oversight of PRA, so I asked my team that question. I'd encourage OGIS to ask counsel. Yeah, we're well. going yeah. to check with our general counsel's um, office. Yeah. Great. Thank you for raising that, Ryan. Yep. Okay, uh, anything else on time volume? That was a great report. Thank you, Emily. Uh, can I turn to the vision subcommittee report um, from Joan Kaminer and Chris Knox? I'm assuming, Joan, you're going to give the report, or is yes. Chris? Uh, Chris is on the, on the line, yes. um, but I'm going to give the report out. Um, so we had some con we've had two meetings to the vision subcommittee, um, but some concerns up front that we wanted to ensure that this subcommittee um, didn't become a you know kitchen sink committee that we had a defined um, mission statement so our first mi meeting focused on uh, drafting um, and brainstorming about that um, mission statement so each of you will find in your packets uh, the vision subcommittee's mission statement um, and on the screen mm -hmm. great thank you um, so I'm not going to read the whole thing for you take your time if you have any comments suggested um, suggestions um, want to discuss how we got to the this mission statement you know talk to anybody on the subcommittee Chris and I um, but I do want to highlight um, the discussion in our second meeting which was what areas were we going to focus on our data collection efforts um, and the decision was made that we would take the mission statement um, and with the five identified um, subparts of that mission statement and have those be essentially our many our sub sub committees or whatever you, yeah. many committees um, so I am going to read those just so because they are the identified areas that we're going to collect uh, information on um, raising the priority of FOIA within the executive branch reconsidering the model of the Office of Government Information Services within the FOIA community increasing accountability for FOIA and transparency <coughs> managing expectations between agencies and the requester community, and the fifth, uh, stressing the need for increased and continued financial support for agency FOIA programs. Um, I would like to um, ask kind of an outstanding question for the whole committee. Um, if you have comments, I don't know if we have time to take them now or if you'd like yes. to just circle with us later. Uh, but we did have a question on the time frame of our recommendations from the vision subcommittee currently in our mission statement we have it as um, a strategic plan for 10 years out um, there was a lot of discussion of whether or not this was um, necessary at all or if it was too <coughs> short or too long of a time frame um, so if you have any input on how you see because i do think it, it matters on where the time frame that we're looking out to because it would dramatically alter what our recommendations would yeah. be we can certainly achieve 
um, different things if we're looking 20 years out, but that certainly, I think, would make the likelihood of being able to track um, and ensure those recommendations are implemented much harder. Um, so, you know, either now or later, Chris or I or anybody else in the committee, um, you would know, like to take your comments on that. Does anyone have any thoughts on that in terms of time frame? And, and I want to invite Patricia Weth, who's hopefully on the phone, who yeah. I know was advocating for a longer time, time frame. Or no time frame at all. Or no time frame at all, I apologize. Yes, hi, this is Patricia West. Um, yes, I was, I, I was advocating for no um, time frame at all, just kind of leaving it open-ended. Or um, the other alternative is to limit it um, to the um, subcommittee's term which is a two-year period. Um, and I think some, some of my colleagues on the committee uh, differed with me, and they thought perhaps it should be longer than 10 years, and, they, and I'll let them um, speak to that. Any, thank you, Patricia. Any other reactions, thoughts? Ryan, um, oh, Ryan, sorry. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Moff. I was just going to just comment that agency um, strategic plans are generally five-year increments, right. and so the Treasury just completed its uh, five-year strategic plan in January. We're on five years, and then again, it's updated. So I think it might be prudent to look at that as an example. Um, the way I think about using a, a vision statement like this is ensuring that it's incorporated into agency strategic plans or in, in planning. Mm -hmm. um, and so since those are updated every five years, it might make sense to look at that as a standard. Yeah. Certainly, I, I don't feel strongly. But, That's but. a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, Lee, Stephen, I, I don't feel strongly either. I think five years is probably a, a, a very workable time for it. But just to, to throw out and support for the 10 years, if you look at the, uh, the FOIA amendments over since the original enactment of FOIA, it's been, there's been an amendment just about every 10, 10 years. years. So t 10 years, or <laughs> it's been two years since the last one, so eight years. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, that, that, makes sense. that time frame actually makes sense to me, given, given that. But uh, I, I do recognize that five years is probably a more workable time frame in terms of actually getting some, something in, with follow-up, uh, uh, something over to look at. To look at. But, just wanted to throw that out. Thanks. This is Joan again. Um, both um, very good points. So um, in our next meeting, um, which we don't have a scheduled time and date for at the moment, um, I think we'll discuss that and just finalize what um, the time frame would be. So thank okay. you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. And you'll report out at the next meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I just have one question. Uh, uh, this is Lee Stephen again. Um, uh, when you were on, on the on the five elements there, reconsidering the model of OGIS, could you just elaborate on that? Sure. This is uh, Joan again. And if anybody from the committee wants to also um, give their take on that, um, we under we heard a lot about OGIS's um, process during the subcommittee meeting. Um, you know. I think it was really helpful to, to understand both the, the workload that they're under as well as um, they, their responsibilities. Um, and we think that we could potentially make some recommendations towards um, either strengthening um, OGIS's ability to um, pursue those responsibilities or other ways to um, emphasize OGIS's role in the FOIA process. Um, so nothing defined at the moment. Um, but we think that it's an area that we should um, look into. And can I mention, or I don't know if you guys want to mention, the, that in a future meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was um, presented that, um, that at a future committee meeting, um, OGIS could make a presentation on um, their workflows, their responsibilities, what they're, they're working on, and also like potential limitations. Um, because even as somebody who has been familiar with OGIS throughout my career, um, I was not even, um, you know, I had not known the extent of what you guys do or how it actually works within um, OGIS. So I think that's going to be a useful presentation. Oh, I was just, it's Melanie. I was just going to say that there's a nice um, symmetry between the five-year strategic plan and 10 years, which is really like just two strategic plans put together. So in some ways, the 10 is kind of nice that way because it would be two strategic plans out. I just remembered when we were first doing, coming up with the three 
uh, subcommittees, vision, as I remember our discussion, we were really thinking about like if we were starting today, how would we do for you? So as I remember the discussion, it was much more really big sky, like how would we sort of start afresh, which makes me think a little bit longer time frame is, is better. Actually, this is, this is Kevin. I, I, I wasn't going to come back to that, but I have a same, similar thought in that. The, I assume the agency strategic plans are scattered, are staggered as well. So some of them might like be coming up next year, and there'd be no way to implement any of this. So in fact, you'd have to be looking at almost in a longer than five-year time frame for any implementation. So it seems like 10 probably makes sense for that reason as well. And this is, sorry, Joan, again, I'm sorry to um, take up so much time. No, <laughs> but from what worry. Melanie was saying, um, I also want to um, emphasize, I know that with these five different areas of our subcommittee, there is overlap um, with the other subcommittees. And I think even between all three of our subcommittees, um, you see some overlap. But in particular with the vision subcommittee, it is that, that big picture um, of what we see FOIA. So to the extent that you know, um, managing expectations is going to play into um, the time and volume subcommittee, we will be taking um, a different perspective um, than maybe immediate recommendations that could be implemented. Okay. Did I hear someone on the phone before oh, we yes. move on? It, Patricia West. Um, I, I, I think I'm in the minority here about no uh, time period on the vision statement, and I'm you know, happy to stand down on that. But also I just wanted to follow up um, about... Uh, having OGIS uh, present at one of, uh, perhaps it could be at our next um, meeting to kind of, uh, you know, assist us in that area of, you know, um, kind of widening their, um, 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 their um, work with, with FOIA. Um, is that something that we could schedule now or do we need to talk about that amongst our committee? So this is Alina. I, I did offer to the subcommittee to do a separate faster presentation. Our next meeting as a committee is not until March of 2019, which is really hard to believe. We're almost in 2019. So I offered both um, just to help facilitate the dialogue within the vision subcommittee. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do both. The important thing is I just want to make sure that I have a job after we're done. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. And so, and I want to speak on behalf of the rest of my staff too. Um, so um, on that note, I want to keep moving and actually invite another uh, wonderful OGIS staff member, our, our newer Deputy Director, Martha Murphy, um, who has actually been um, wonderfully gracious to take on the task of keeping track of monitoring uh, where we are with recommendations from the past two terms of the FOIA Advisory Committee. And she is going to talk about that today, um, field any questions. So uh, there is a PowerPoint that goes with it. It's got colors. It's very pretty. pretty. pictures. Okay. Okie doke. Um, I'll try to make this quick because I know we're all getting hungry. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, the first recommendation uh, dealt with best practices um, and directed OGIS to promote the identified best practices from the previous committee. Um, we have been actively doing this. We hosted a panel at the 2018 OGIS annual open meeting. Um, we have presented at two ASAP functions, a brown bag lunch, and at the 2018 National Training Conference. Um, we presented at the October 2018 Chief FOIA Officers uh, Council meeting. Um, we have also incorporated these best practices in um, questions into the next records management self-assessment. And um, we have incorporated the best practices into OGIS's dispute resolution training, um, which we um, are ongoing. So um, we won't forget about this. We'll continue to incorporate it in anything that we possibly can. Um, we can move on. Recommendation number one proposed that the Chief FOIA Officers Council seek to establish a technology subcommittee. I'm pleased to announce that that has occurred. Um, there is a technology subcommittee that has been established. Um, they will have their first formal meeting coming up in early December, but they've already met with Melanie and Alina 
and had some conversations via email. Um, tentatively, their three goals are to study utilization and deployment of technology and create a catalog of who's doing what, what, what are the agencies using. Um, then from that, they hope to highlight best practices and then finally work with the CIO Council to make recommendations. So we're moving along there. Recommendation number two is complete, hooray. Um, the 2019 Chief FOIA Officer's Report will include the answer to the following question, which I'm not gonna read aloud to you, but it's up there. Um, and um, you'll be reporting out on that. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> Next slide. Recommendation number three suggests a modification to the Federal Acquisition Regulation, which is referred to as the FAR, to require all agencies when they're acquiring electronic records to consider uh, FOIA needs in the acquisitions. Um, initially, we had uh, thought that a, a letter from the archivist to the FAR was the way we wanted to go, but we've actually been meeting with NARA's FAR Council representative and she's clarified that the best way to move forward is to draft a business case that we then submit to the FAR. So we are working on that now and hope to have um, a draft business case to the FAR by the spring of 2019. Recommendation um, number four talks about launching an interagency effort to develop standard requirements for FOIA processing tools and to ensure that both the tools and their outputs are Section 508 compliant. Um, we um, are considering that in this situation, it is likely that recommendation number one and number three are gonna cover some of the goals from this recommendation. Um, but we really would like to discuss with the wider uh, the committee um, where the gaps might be in that um, and uh, I'll be honest, we're, we're sort of struggling a little bit on how to, to move forward on this um, because we do think it's somewhat uh, going to be covered by other recommendations. Um, one idea that we do have is to have an industry day at some point in time, but before you can do an industry day and bring in folks, you need to know what requirements you're looking for. So uh, we, we will likely be reaching out to the committee on this one. Recommendation number five. Request that OGIS conduct an assessment of the methods undertaken by agencies to prepare documents for posting. Um, we're going to be addressing this uh, through OGIS's compliance team, which is currently a compliance team of one. <laughs> um, so hopefully we will have another staff member coming on board um, in the next fiscal, in the, yeah, in fiscal year 2019. And our goal right now is to launch um, this compliance report in uh, the fourth quarter of 2019. Recommendation number six, encourages OGIS to highlight the issues of proactive disclosure and Section 508 compliance in its report to Congress. Um, OGIS will include this information in our 2019 annual report on fiscal year 2018. Um, and we usually try to publish that annual report around uh, Sunshine Week in March, so that is our goal, second quarter of 2019. Um, recommendation seven, Again, we're directing uh, OGIS to examine the use of appropriate performance standards in federal employee appraisal records um, and work plans to ensure compliance with the requirements of the FOIA. Um, again, this will be addressed by our OGIS compliance team once we have staff available. And our goal right now is to launch that effort in the beginning of fiscal year 2020. Um, that is an area that's kind of near and dear to my heart. It's something that I did incorporate um, in my previous role as a FOIA supervisor, and I think it's a, we'll be working hard on that. Okie doke, that's the whole thing. Does anyone have any questions about the seven recommendations? Yes. Hey, this is John. John. Um, does anyone know, is FOIA online 508 compliant? I... Okay. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure I was it just is. curious. Yeah, no, I'm sure it is. I'm sure. So I think I actually know the answer to that, that it's only partially 508 compliant is what folks have told us. But your home agency is the one that sponsors FOIA online. So I would check with them and ask. Um, I do know Somebody when else I... else in my agency, by the way. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I do know this issue had come up um, for, for us as an agency at NARA uh, when I was still in the general counsel's office um, because we actually thought little elves worked in the middle of the night 
to make these documents 508 compliant before we posted anything to FOIA online. And I'm not being facetious, I'm being serious. But there are no such elves making shoes or making these documents 508 compliant. So that's why I'm, I'm saying only partially because I think it's really incumbent upon each agency as they process and get ready to post the documents to make them 508 compliant. So as Melanie knows and others who were on the committee in the past, the 508 um, issue has been one that we continue to struggle with. Um, and so, you know, it's back to recommendation five, I believe. We definitely want to invite um, committee help and uh, ideas about how to, how to move forward, but it's definitely a, an issue that's vexing um, a lot of agencies. Uh, Melanie, again, um, when I was answering your question, I, there's a distinction between the sort of the, the public facing pieces of right. FOIA online, right. Right. which I'm sure would be 508 compliant, and what, the issue that Aline is addressing, which is actually really the heart of it, which is are the documents that agencies release under the right. FOIA through FOIA online 508 compliant, which is a different question altogether. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, if you find out, can you let us know at the next committee meeting? That would really be helpful. I'll report back. <laughs> Thank you. I, I um, have one question. Yes, please. Um, for recommendation four. So can you just state your name again? Emily Creighton. Thank you. For recommendation four, um, talking about launching the interagency rep effort to develop standard requirements for FOIA processing tools, you talked about an. Um, could you just sort of walk us through again what the plan is there? And, and you mentioned an industry day. I'm not sure I know what industri an industry day is. So an industry day is when you come up with requirements that you're looking for for technology. Um, and my understanding, and Alina, please jump in um, if you know more than I do on this. Uh, you, those requirements kind of go out to, um, they have, there's a term for it. It's a request for an RF something. Oh, information? <laughs> request is it an RFI? Proposal. RFI. Request for proposal RFP, and um, you, and then they sort of invite, but it doesn't contractors to to come in one place in one time and show their wares, basically. And so all, all the agencies would be yeah. present. It would be a, a, it's public. It's a public uh, event that okay. anyone can anyone can attend. Is my understanding. So over here, we think it's an RFI, <laughs> yeah. okay. a request, request for, for information. information. Request for information. Um, I, and I can tell you, Emily, also, we, uh, we OGIS, had some preliminary discussions with um, folks at GSA um, who are actually already working with Lawrence's office uh, in the Crow's office. They're, they're actually um, interested in, in similar issues and um, the process by which they went through uh, and got GSA help is something that we were also looking into in order to, you know, to start this process down the road. But um, we w just weren't sure if that was actually going to do the trick or really address the delta that is, is really going on here. And so that's why we're, I think, a little more hesitant on this recommendation. I think the other, the challenge is to, to really identify what are the requirements that we need. And I think this is our challenge as, as well with the uh, FAR business case. So, yes. um, I mean, I think we can all say that we want sufficient search um, and the ability to export, potentially. Um, the question of whether you get into redaction technology is something separate. Right. That's, that may be a separate, right. a separate technology that's not needed to be built into every electronic system, but certainly search and potentially export would be. What else is there? So I think that that's what we're looking for is mm -hmm. a little bit of guidance from the committee or perhaps a way forward to try to determine that. Um, what are those things that we're actually looking for? Thank you. I'm looking meaningfully at Tom, who I know was uh, very active in the last committee about Section 508 issues. So yeah, no, if you have any thoughts, uh, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, you can. No, I was actually in. waiting for the next update, and that is the progress report on the recommendation of the first advisory committee. Yes. Which so, I know is your bailiwick, uh, but it seems to me that we have a responsibility to at least ask that question. Right. Sure. So that's fair, and um, we are moving that along. Um, I actually just yesterday, if I can share that yeah, publicly, sure, sure. Um, shared with Melanie uh, an updated draft. Uh, we have put together, um, and Sheila Portanovo, our attorney advisor, has actually worked very hard on this with our summer law clerk to try to come up with a red line version that we've circulated. Mm -hmm. We wanted OIP to look at it, and then we wanted to proceed to OMB. 
So um, my goal is to keep this moving and try to get it to them before the holidays. Can we, Alina, can you just summarize what, what the... Yes, I'm sorry. So the recommendation of the first subcommittee, we actually consider it complete. Yeah. We consider it, it complete. It was um, to, uh, the recommendation to the archivist to make a recommendation to OMB that they update and revise their 1987 antiquated um, FOIA, fee, uh, FOIA fee guidelines. Um, and we did that very promptly after the yeah. committee was terminated, but I think what we're talking about now is the actual content of right. the right. guideline well, itself. And that's what we've been working on. Yeah, if I can, I mean, it, some of these recommendations from last year that say agency should, you know, we recommend, and you can say, well, we've completed our work because we rec made the recommendation. But I think our interest is in implementation sure. actually at the working level. So yes. thank Which you. Is, I think why we're taking the next step to try yeah, to Yeah, no, make exactly easy for right. Them, right? I, <laughs> correct, correct. Yes. Thank you. So, yep. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions or thoughts from our committee members before we move on to public comments? Um, any folks on the phone want to say anything before we move on? Okay, going once, going twice. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, so um, this is our, our opportunity at the end of the meeting to invite anyone from um, members of the public to uh, provide the committee with comments, uh, questions, etc. cetera. Um, so we will um, ask folks who are interested in asking any questions to step up to the microphone that's located on my left, I guess the right side of the room. Um, if you could please state your name and affiliation, that would be great. Um, and uh, come on up. Hello, uh, Alex Howard. Nice to see some of you again. Uh, sorry I was a little bit late. Uh, there was some uh, breaking news in other parts of the justice system that I was watching. Um, I was curious about the status of um, what you've all seen with FOIA.gov. Uh, I've missed the last meeting as well, and I'm uh, wondering if you've seen a change in uh, the public's uh, use of uh, FOIA or in your agencies, or if you've uh, discussed the impact um, of its integration, and uh, with, uh, specifically with respect to the uh, Department of Justice, um, if you've seen agencies uh, setting up any APIs um, to use it. Uh, since I hadn't seen any updates um, on your websites or in the press about it. Thank you. Sure. Um, the age, we, there has been some progress made on, in terms of API interoperability with the portal, but there's, it's not, nothing is launched quite yet, but I can, I can at least report that we are aware of progress being made. Um, the next step in the process is there's going to be a memo from uh, OMB and DOJ giving t deadlines for agencies to establish their um, API interoperability. Um, and so that's, that would be the next thing that you'll look for. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sheila, do we have any comments uh, from folks on the uh, live stream? Um. You've had some interest in NARA itself and its role in the digitization process that was spoken about earlier, um, but there are no questions or comments directed to the committee at this time. Okay, we must be doing a great job. All right, anyone else um, out there want to ask any questions? Going once, going twice. All right, um, does anyone else have any questions or comments or concerns that they want to talk about before we adjourn. Okay. Uh, Kirsten would like for me to remind everyone to please return your folders uh, because we are running low. So we are going to recycle them for the next time. Um, and I want to remind everyone to visit our website and our social media for more information about our activities and how you can participate. Um, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, March 20th. Uh, so it's a Wednesday, not a Thursday. It's when we could get the McGowan Theater, uh, 10 a.m. It's going to follow 
right after Sunshine Week. Uh, we hope you will join us for um, our celebration of Sunshine Week. Uh, we're also going to celebrate OGIS's 10th anniversary. Um, on Monday, March 11th, wow. 2019, it's going to be in the afternoon, in the morning. Please go to DOJ for <laughs> Melanie Sunshine Week celebration. Uh, we're, yes, and we're going to be here in the afternoon, starting at 1 o'clock in the McGowan Theater. Um, thank you again to all the committee members for your participation, and keep up all the great work. And uh, if there are no questions or concerns, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.